Welcome to something to wrestle with. Something to wrestle with. Bruce Pritchard. Bruce Pritchard. Well, you know. That's not a rib. She pooted. She pooted. Is that a rib? No, you have a big There's no box of gimmicks. Rumor and innuendo. I don't deal in rumor and innuendo. It, it, it. Was he there? I was there. Say something about I don't give a <laughs> shit. <laughs> I ain't scared. I ain't scared to shit. Fuck you. Fuck you, Bruce. I love God damn, kid. God damn it. What the hell show you got there? I need more. Ooh, yeah. What say you? Pronouns, pal. And now, something to wrestle with. Me. Con Bruce Pritchard. He the second most recognizable athlete in the entire world today. Oh. Conrad Olsen. What happened when? Huh. What would Vince say about that? Well, hey, Vince. I'm sure it's a good night. Yeah. It's so big. Yeah. Let's go. Bullshit. Welcome to WrestleMania. World title now. Welcome to something to wrestle with. Something to wrestle with. Something to wrestle with. Something to wrestle with. Dig it. Bruce Pritchard. How's it going, everyone? It's time for a very special Megasoed edition of Something to Wrestle with Bruce Pritchard. I'm John Alba filling in for Conrad Thompson this week. And as you may have assumed, Bruce is very much busy himself on the road to SummerSlam in Nashville. So we wanted to put together this very special Megasode. And in honor of the newest member of the Ad Free Shows team, Mr. Kevin Nash, we decided to dedicate it all to him. And as I mentioned, Bruce is on the road to SummerSlam in Nashville. And so are we over at the Ad Free Shows family. Of course, I'm talking about StarCast 5. That is going down July 29th through the 31st at the Nashville Fairgrounds. I'm going to be there, and so should you. And if you want to get in on all the fun, you can pick up your tickets now, StarCast.com. You'll find out all the information that you need on tickets, merchandise, and meet and greets. Of course, what makes StarCast so special this year is that it's leading to Ric Flair's last match at the Nashville Municipal Auditorium, July 31st, 2022. We are going to be packing this place with a card that is just absolutely massive, featuring talent from Impact Wrestling, AAA, MLW, and many, many more. This is going to be a show that you are never going to want to miss out on either live or on replay so make sure you pick up your tickets for that as well rickflareslastmatch.com or you could also watch it on fight tv it is going to be a weekend that we will not forget and we hope that you can join us there as well now if you're familiar with my voice you may remember that i host a show on adfreeshows.com as well with one of our favorites here on something to wrestle mr eric bischoff that of course is strictly business available for 29 dollars and up a month eric and i dive into the business of the business it is one of our favorite shows on adfreeshows.com and if you're an adfree shows subscriber you know that eric does not hold back and a guy who's not going to hold back well that is kevin nash because not only are we talking about him on this special Megasode, but he is going to be one of the stars of Click This. And episode one is coming to you July 11th at 6 a.m. Eastern. He and Sean Oliver, well, they've established so much chemistry over the years with their shoot interviews. I know this podcast is going to rule. And that as well can be found on adfreeshows.com. Click This, launching on July 11th. So with that, I think it's time to get into episode 222 of Something to Wrestle with Bruce Pritchard. And with that, we are talking Kevin Nash in WWE. Part one of our conversation begins as Kevin Nash leaves WCW after he was Oz and Vinny Vegas and sets forth for New York, where he joins up with a special friend and makes quite an impact. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Something to Wrestle with. 
Bruce Pritchard. Bruce, what's going on, man? How are you? Absolutely fantabulous. Well, man, I am fired up about today's episode. This has been a long time in the making. We have enjoyed talking about Shawn Michaels and Sean Waltman and Razor Ramon. And now it's time to talk about diesel. Pretty excited about this one. It's going to be one of our more in-depth shows. Uh, originally I was going to call this Kevin Nash in the WWE. I don't think I can get to it all, man. When we started putting this format together, we're more than a hundred pages deep and you can see all of the research over at adfreeshows.com. but I think we're going to be able to get the diesel story in today. Um, let's jump right into it. June 8th, 1993. Uh, this is the write-up from the observer. Shawn Michaels regained the intercontinental title from Marty Jannetty on June 6th in Albany, New York at a house show. It was pretty well known. Jannetty was just going to be a short-term champion. Although short-term being just 20 days was a surprise. Michael's new bodyguard, Kevin Nash, who hasn't been given a name in the WWF interfered, causing the win. Michaels and Nash appeared on the June 7th raw with Nash still not being given a name and Michaels being acknowledged as new champion. And as a reminder, uh, the backstory here is, uh, explained by Meltzer. WCW's Vinny Vegas, who was led out of his contract by Ole Anderson earlier in the week after being asked to be released after being turned down for a raise, which was obviously a ploy since he must have had a WWF spot lined up. And the rumor has always been that Kevin Nash was discovered by the WWF when the Steiner brothers were watching WCW Saturday night with Shawn Michaels and Shawn watched and knew he had to have him as his heater. And the Steiner brothers made the connection. How true is that? Do you think that's the way it went down? Sean watching TV with uh, the Steiner brothers and saying, oh, I need that guy. That is the way it went down. That's tremendous. Uh, you know, uh, look, Sean was, Sean was hot, but Sean was also looking for something else. And Sean was looking for a bodyguard type. And when he saw, uh, Kevin, as Vinny Vegas was like, Hey, this guy fits and asked, uh, Scott and Rob who, who he is. And they knew him and the rest, as they say, is history. Do you know the story about Ole and Nash and asking for the release? I mean, supposedly Nash goes and asks for a raise at a time when he knows WCW is not doing that. He's turned down. He asked for his release. Uh, I think. He insinuates that, oh, he's just going to go back to being a bouncer. Or he's got some other gigs lined up and, uh, they give him his release and he immediately faxes the release to the WWF and, uh, already has a spot lined up and is ready to roll. Is that the way you remember hearing that story with him and Oli? You know, I've, I've heard that story. I don't know. I don't know how all that went down and everything as far as our stuff. Sean brought the idea and right. we took a look at Vinny Vegas and saw, okay, Hey, yeah, here's a guy that has a great look. Good Lord. He, he was huge. The next step was to bring Kevin in and meet Kevin and talk to him. So Kevin came in, met at Vince's house and Sean was with him. Came up and, you know, of course, good Lord, Vince took one look at him and was like, holy shit, look at the size of this guy. Mm. Um, plus, he's a charming son of a bitch. Yes. Kevin Nash is is an extremely charming, charming uh, individual and just charmed the hell out of everybody there, which was, you know, Vince, myself and Pat. Deal was done. It was like, hey, you get a release and, and we're good to go. We, you know, we just need to see it. Um, the rest, man, shit. History, baby. Who would have been the person handling Diesel's contract? Would this have been the JJ Dillon JJ. era? Okay. Yeah. Um, it, this is, in this era, the contracts were, well, a little different than they are now. Do you want to remind everybody what WWF contracts looked like in 1993? Well, at that point, all you were guaranteed, the only monetary guarantee was $25 per TV. And you got to understand the, the television 
that was the opportunity to make yourself a star. And if you made yourself a star on television, then you were worth something in the live events. And that's where you made your money was the live events. Let's, um, let's talk about why Vince was so enamored with Kevin Nash. The rumor and innuendo is that, you know, we're on the heels of the Zahorian trial. Things are about to get pretty rough. Uh, there is a lot of, uh, for better or worse, steroid controversy surrounding the world wrestling federation. But we've always heard whether this is true or not, that Vince wanted talent that stood out. And it's often mentioned that there was almost like an airport test. If this guy's just walking through an airport, does he stand out? Does he get everyone's attention? Does he turn heads? Do people say, who is that guy? Well, Kevin Nash being seven foot tall checks that box. And he was also very muscular and supposedly clean. And this would be very attractive to someone like Vince who has, you know, now decided, Hey, we've got to move as far away from anything that remotely looks or smells like steroids. Kevin Nash could be our guy. How true is that story that we've heard over the years? Well, goddamn, it's, it's not like it's a secret. Look at the guy Yeah, and Kevin has a presence. Kevin looks like somebody, um, <laughs> you know, Kevin walked in into a room to this day and every head in the place turns, even in an atmosphere of giants. So when you go back and you go to a lot of these conventions, first of all, you can see the guy uh, over the crowd because he's just that tall. Um, but Ke- Kevin carries himself like a star and looks like a star. Well, and that's important. You know, I know that that, uh, you know, sometimes some of our listeners may say, oh, well, that's silly. But realistically, I mean, that's what's going to quote unquote draw money. People want to see stars. And when you present yourself as a star, people will pay to see you. And certain people paid to see him. We didn't really talk about this, but was he, I mean, was the original creative idea just to be Shawn Michaels bodyguard? Or do you think he saw some other potential in him? I guess what I'm talking about is just in ring work, you know, uh, quote unquote, smart marks later in his career would be critical of Kevin Nash and say, oh, he's got, you know, five or six moves, maybe seven. If you count the hair flip or whatever, Jim Cornette's knock on Kevin Nash's in ring work was, was the original idea. Hey, let's just pair him up with Sean and then maybe Sean can uh, sort of show him the ropes and help him along a little bit with some of the in-ring psychology and move set and stuff like that. Or did we even get that far in the thinking? Well, at the beginning, I don't think that anybody was looking at Vinny Vegas to come in and headline WrestleMania at that point. But when you met Kevin and you talk to him and you're in his presence, you realize there's potential there. Now, some people like Lex Luger made an entire career on potential and Kevin just had, you know, that gift of gab that he was able to convince anybody that, that he talked to that he would do whatever it took. The idea was always originally put him with Sean. And if you can't learn something from being at ringside with Sean Michaels every night, right. Then there's no hope. The idea was put him there. And eventually at some point we'll, Put Kevin in the ring as a big heater. He could be the heater for Sean. And you've got a big nasty heel. You take it from there. King of the Ring 93, we would see Sean retain the IC, pitting crush in 11 minutes and 14 seconds. Uh, that's not important. What is important is this piece of the write up from the Observer. They gave Kevin Nash the name Diesel in a pre match interview. Diesel distracted Crush, allowing Sean to post him several times, but Crush kicked out of the pen. Either way, the idea is we've now got a name. Let's talk about that. How do we decide on Diesel? Whose idea is this? What is the character? I mean, how was it described to him originally? Well, the the character is just a big badass bodyguard. Uh, Shane McMahon is actually the one that came up with the name Diesel because 
Diesel, I guess, was slang for the young, hip kids at the time for somebody who was jacked up, tough guy, jack guy. Hey, man, they're 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 diesel. Yeah, the uh, diesel was born in the South. It was cock diesel, but you know the uh, the NBA had a new player named Shaquille O'Neal who was setting the world on fire in '92, and uh, he referred to himself as Shaq Diesel. So. There you go. I had no idea that that was Shane McMahon and it was just from, you know, popular culture, especially when it has a literal, uh, sound effect at the beginning of his theme song, you know, the younger person in me, not thinking about the pop culture thing. Here's the presentation of I guess maybe Vince or Jim Johnston took very literally with the sound effect of the big truck. And you think, wait a minute, does this mean this giant is uh, a truck driver? Or he's as big as a truck. What is this? He is a truck. There you go. He is a big goddamn diesel engine that's going to come at you and fucking knock you down. Um, so it was a it was a little bit of both. It was one of their double entendres. This episode is being brought to you by Zen Nicotine Pouches, the simpler way to experience nicotine satisfaction and enjoy lasting change on your terms. Zen Nicotine Pouches are a fresher, simpler way to enjoy nicotine that's helped millions of people achieve lasting change by offering smoke-free and spit-free satisfaction. I don't know about you, but there's been many times in my life where I needed to make a change like trying to be healthier or spending less time at work. I knew I needed to make a change, but I just wasn't ready yet. And a lot of smokers and dippers out there can probably relate. Zen understands there isn't just one quote unquote right time to make a change. Everyone's timeline is a little different. Everyone's on their own journey. So whether you feel like you're ready to take that first step towards change, Zen will be there with you with the right strength, with the right flavor at the right time. If you're thinking about making a change and you want to learn more today, check out Zen nicotine pouches at ZYN.com. That's Zen.com. That's ZYN.com. Warning, this product contains nicotine. Nicotine is an addictive chemical. We should mention that uh, the July 19th, Monday Night Raw, Meltzer would say, featured one of the best matches on WWF television perhaps ever with Shawn Michaels and Marty Jannetty working what he called a four and three quarter match. Um, how good were Michaels and Jannetty together? I, you know, it's a shame. We never saw that on a big stage like WrestleMania. I know that was originally in the cards at nine. And then, you know, we had to call an audible. We've covered that before, but Sean and, and Marty had just unreal matches together. Did they not? Yeah, they were. Good Lord, they were tag team partners forever. They knew each other inside and out, and both tremendous workers. Great chemistry, made for great matches. Kevin Nash's WWF debut in the ring happens on July 27th, 1993 at a TV taping, but it's a dark match where Razor Ramon and Marty Jannetty team up to face Diesel and Sean. In the match, Jannetty, the babyface, of course, picks up a win over Sean. His Madison Square Garden debut, where he would headline, believe it or not, with Shawn Michaels and Bam Bam Bigelow against Marty Jannetty, Tatanka, and Mr. Perfect in an elimination match. Diesel would pin Jannetty for the first elimination before it came down to him and Mr. Perfect when Diesel punches him in the back of the head to pin him. Really process what we're talking about here, guys. This is his first time being in Madison Square Garden. He's fresh off of being Vinny Vegas in like Montgomery, Alabama television tapings. Now he's in New York city at Madison square garden working on top and he's pinning Mr. Perfect in the main event. This is fucking unbelievable. This is the definition as I think, uh, the old saying goes of, Hey man, we're going to strap the rocket to him. Right? Yeah. Again, it was one of those take it as it goes and wanted to see what the reaction was. You know, we had the, the diesel spot in the Royal rumble where again, he was unproven and had everyone come in and he dumped everybody out. So that there were, that's where we, we got to the point where we said, Jesus Christ, we, we've got a baby face on our hands, but putting them out there, you've got to see what you, what you have. And, Kevin was a, you know, there was interest there. It was, he was believable. People 
looked at him and said, holy shit, this, this guy's something special. And he was something special. At SummerSlam 93, we see what we believe is going to be Kevin Nash's finisher. It happens after a match with Shawn Michaels and Mr. Perfect. After the match, Perfect comes after Diesel and Diesel uses a KO punch. So he knocks him out and Meltzer would say that appears to be his gimmick. And we know he's going to transition into a power bomb. Do you think the original idea was to use a knockout punch as his <laughs> finisher? <laughs> the standing joke with diesel and Sean and I was every time that we would lay out a heartbreak hotel where Kevin stood, stood up there. Kevin never said a word and Kevin would always always ask as I laid everything out, I said, Hey Bruce, what do you want me to do? You know, you want me to say anything? You want me to do anything? And I used to just hold up my fist with this black glove and, you know, just keep making a fist and, and like, you know, hold the fist like the, the spoiler did the guys, with the heart punch did. And he said, Oh, got it. Hey man, is it okay if I do this one time? <laughs> like he would stretch his fingers out. So it became a, Okay, you want me to just stand there and, and make a fist? You got it, big guy. So it was kind of a take on that. I, well, what if it's a, it's a knockout punch and he uses the big gloved hand? To, he's got a hell of a right hand. See how that works. Well, we don't get a lot of time with it. Meltzer would write a considerable bit of talent turmoil hit the world wrestling federation this past weekend, including the first time in more than a decade that a champion left the promotion before leaving or losing his belt. Intercontinental champion, Shawn Michaels, 28 considered by many as the best worker in the country quit the company early last week before a match could take place where he would lose his title. While this was not confirmed at press time, it was believed that there would be a 20 man tournament for the vacant title on September 27th at the television tapings in New Haven, Connecticut, man, you got to feel bad for diesel. He comes in here in June in three months, Sean's quitting and he's out of here. Where did this leave diesel? Did you have any conversations with Kevin during this time about, all right, listen, don't worry. Sean will be back, but here's what we're doing with you. Well, it's kind of, it's one of those situations where I quit, but yeah, okay. You can quit, but doesn't matter. You're not going to go anywhere. You're not going to do anything else. And, um, you're still under contract. So you can quit all you want. <laughs> Meltzer even says as much a couple of weeks later, he says, while the rumors have continued to persist as the reason Michaels quit the WWF, nothing has been able to be confirmed. The storyline reason given was that Jack Tunney suspended Michaels and stripped him of the title for failure to complete his contractual obligations, which sounds like a pretty honest reason. Michael's departure was first announced on September 27th on Monday night raw, which aired live from new Haven. That's where they announced the 20 man tournament. This is our 20 man battle Royal rather. Uh, it, it is kind of fun to think about the hokey pokey relationship at times between Sean Michaels and Vince McMahon. And especially during this time, because it was during a time when Sean would just take his stuff and go home and talk about Vince counting his, his millions in his ivory tower. And you don't appreciate me. And, uh, that's where the rumor started about Sean inheriting millions of dollars from some fan and all that wonderful stuff. So it, it was, just, uh, ongoing and Sean would go home and they'd make up and we'd move on. Let's talk about, uh, how we finish here. We've got a battle Royal. The idea is it's going to come down to two guys and the last two guys are going to have a match and we're going to decide who the new champion is. It comes down to Rick Martel and razor Ramon razor is the new champ. Once razor goes over, it feels like the natural program would be diesel. Since Diesel was Sean's bodyguard, why do you think we never got there? I don't think that I don't think Kevin was ready at that point. I really don't. Um, he still needed more time in the ring, and just he just needed more time more than anything else. 
let's um let's keep it going here i, I do want to ask you know we haven't really talked about this yet at this point in real life how tight are sean and kevin nash and what's the relationship like with kevin nash and scott hall here uh, the three of them were friends you know um sean and scott hall were friends and then of course Kevin Nash coming in and Kevin Nash and Scott were friends from WCW as well. So that, that kind of click, if you will, of former WCW guys, or at least recent WCW guys, which Hall had come from WCW, the Steiners, uh, they kind of hung out, but Sean and Sean and Kevin immediately started traveling together again. The idea behind that was so that Kevin could learn. Right. That's where you learn, man. You learned in the car going up and down the road and, and talk about your matches and talk about what you're going to do next. And you learn from the veterans, tell stories about what worked back then and saying, Hey kid, you ought to try this. Um, that that's the secret to the business. Let's, um, let's talk about Sean's or, or diesel's rather pay-per-view wrestling debut. It happens at Survivor Series. It's Marty Jannetty, one, two, three, kid, Razor Ramon, and Randy Savage on one side, IRS, Rick Martel, Adam Baum, and Diesel on the other. Boy, which one of these is not like the other, huh? Uh, two and three quarter stars here. It's uh, interesting. Savage is the one to pin Diesel to win the first fall with an elbow drop off the top in 10 minutes and 20 seconds. It's a big deal for Diesel to be on pay per view. And it's a big deal to be working with, you know, a superstar, a bona fide legend like Macho Man Randy Savage. What's the feeling as we we sort of wrap up 1993 about Kevin Nash from the office's perspective? I mean, our original plan was we're going to put him with Sean and see how it goes. Very quickly, there's problems with Sean. Now he's sort of out here trying to find his own way. He's teaming with Adam Baum. And Rick Martell and IRS, and he's the first one to take the pin. Where, where, how's this going? Do you think just six months in? Well, who who wasn't like the rest? You got uh, well, Diesel, Adam, Martell, Adam Bomb, and IRS. That's a hell of a formidable team. Well, okay. Um, is the office? I mean, at this point, do you guys see money in him? Is it just we're going to get there? It's a process. What's the thinking? Well, again, it's somebody's got to go. And the idea at the time was to get to the Savage and Crush story as well. Um, somebody's somebody's got to lose. Diesel wasn't established at that point. And losing a match to the Macho Man Randy Savage is not the end of the world. Oh, no, no, I'm not saying that. I'm just wondering, you know, since we've had to sort of alter our plans because of Shawn Michaels, where, where does that leave the office thinking about him. I mean, for instance, when we do like the year end awards and the wrestling observer, uh, worst wrestler of the year award, diesel gets honorable mention. Uh, I'm not saying that he's the worst wrestler. I'm just saying that people are saying, oof, mm, maybe not ready for prime time. You know, you ever know that th this is interesting because you ever notice when, when Meltzer talks about the worst things in the world, they're usually the ones that make the most money and, and draw the most. Well, are you about to say that Diesel made the most money for the WWF and drew the most? Because he eventually did. No, we're going to get to that. I'm sure. <laughs> uh, no, listen, I'm excited to talk about that because I think that's a false narrative. But let's keep going for now. At Royal Rumble '94, uh, Diesel does find himself uh, getting involved with the silliness of Yokozuna and the Undertaker. Uh, the Undertaker went to heaven. We'll talk, we've talked about that before. Um, we he also, ascended. All righty. Okay. Uh, we've also got Bret Hart and Lex Luger tying to win the Royal Rumble. Uh, Kevin Nash was involved in this. He's going to uh, dump out Bart Gunn at eight minutes and 55 seconds. Scott Steiner at nine minutes and four seconds. Owen Hart at nine minutes and nine seconds. Uh, Quang at nine minutes and 23 seconds. And that empties out the Quang. ring. What's that? Kwong? Kwong. Uh, next in and out is uh, Bob Backlund. 
and Meltzer would write dumping Backlund firmly established diesel as a baby face next in and out was Billy Gunn. I mean, it is, it is for a little while in this rumble, the diesel show. I mean, he's even going to eliminate Bigelow crush and Michaels. And that plants the, the seeds for Michael's diesel breakup since Michael's didn't help diesel when he was in trouble and help to try to dump him out. Um, let me back that up. So after all of these eliminations, diesel of course has to be eliminated and it happens at the hands of bam, bam, Bigelow crush. And believe it or not, Shawn Michaels, which plants the seeds for the eventual Shawn Michaels diesel breakup since Michaels didn't help diesel when he was in trouble and instead helped dump him out. This is rather fast. It feels like he would have maybe continued this a little more, but we start to at least plant the seeds of doubt. How did you guys, or or why did you know, Hey, if we're going to split these guys up eventually, it's definitely going to be Sean. Who's going to maintain the heel status. I don't know that we did know that. And other than that was during a time that Vince swore that Shawn Michaels never, ever, ever be a baby face. Um, he was a heel through and through and by God, he was a heel and will never, ever, 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 ever. Um, the Royal rumble is an opportunity where you can try a lot of different things and you can test the waters. Uh, I still, to this day, refer to the the spot in the Royal Rumble. If you have someone that goes in and, and makes a stand and dumps a lot of people is the diesel spot. Because that's what we did with, with Kevin here. We, we put him in a spot where um, he dumped a lot of people, had a spotlight on him, and looked good. I love that it's still called that. We've seen that several times. But we're having some internet problems on Bruce's side this morning. Bruce, can you say again, we will never, ever, 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 ever. What was the rest of that? We didn't get that. Sean will never, ever, 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 ever be a baby face. Thank you. Uh, WrestleMania 10. Of course, we know Razor Ramon and Shawn Michaels are going to steal the show in 18 minutes and 47 seconds. Diesel clotheslines Ramon early and then is thrown out. I guess it makes sense to get rid of Diesel at ringside and just let these two go. Uh, I don't know how much sense it makes for it to be a, a, a DQ type situation since it is a no disqualification, but either way we're overthinking it. They stole the freaking show. Uh, the April 4th, 94 episode of the wrestling observer or that issue rather Meltzer would write, they set up what will apparently be an intercontinental title match on TV at the next taping with razor Ramon defending against diesel, which will probably be a title switch to set up a house show program. So now we're finally getting to the razor diesel program. Uh, now that everyone is back in place and, and doing their thing and they just stole the show at WrestleMania is the click starting to form at this point. Those guys are riding together and get a little bit of momentum between the three of them. Well, I, I think they just kind of reconnected and, and got back together. It wasn't like it was all new and they were forming. They pretty much had been together from the start when, Diesel came in, but it was, Hey, the band's back together. Uh, April 18th in the observer Meltzer writes, Sean was working as diesel's manager, which it appears he's going to be doing at all the tapings until he gets back in the ring. He's wrestling in dark matches on TV nights as well. This is sort of fun. You know, originally Nash is brought in to be on the outside for Sean's matches. And now it's uh, a whole 180 here. What's the, uh, why the decision to have Sean stop working and get diesel going? Is it so Sean can coach him up? Is Sean nursing some injuries? What do you remember about that? Well, it's still the same thing. It was an opportunity to put Kevin out there and have a real live, honest to God coach on the outside of the ring, calling his matches for him and helping tell him what the hell to do. So who better than Sean? On the 25th of April, it would be written diesel won the intercontinental from razor on April 13th at the superstars tapings in Rochester, New York, in a match that will likely air in syndication during the May sweeps finish saw Ramon go after Sean and was caught from behind and then pinned with the jackknife parentheses power bomb. Why here? And why now was sweeps motivation? 
as Meltzer speculated? As far as the time, the time to put the championship on him? Right. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know that that was why we put the title on him, but I mean, we put the title on him because we wanted to make a change and we were going to do something with Kevin, but putting it on TV on superstars, that was always during the time of sweeps where we had marquee matches. Yes. Just saying it's like three weeks after WrestleMania 10, you know, where they just stole the show with the ladder match and, and we're making a change here. This is also the first time that the observer uses the word jackknife and then in parentheses explains power bomb. How did we ultimately land on that finish? Do you recall? I mean, in WCW, he didn't use a power bomb. He used the snake eyes and things like that, or he would just pick his, he didn't use a, he didn't use a power bomb in WWE either. He did the jackknife and it was because if you watch a power bomb, it's done differently. And Kevin didn't, didn't like the idea of somebody's, uh, feet coming up and legs coming up and possibly hitting them in the face. So a lot of guys didn't like taking the jack the jack knife knife from diesel because he would just let him go. Right. So it was a little different because man, with the power bomb and again, a lot of different, lot of different variations, but like Vader would pick, would pick a guy up and drive him down. And that's where the power bomb came from to give it a different name. A, but also Kevin did it differently than other people did. Did it different than Sid. He did it different than, uh, Vader Vader. And that kind of helped in, this isn't a power bomb. And it wasn't to someone is limited in their knowledge. that doesn't want to open their mind. Uh, like dirt sheet mongers, gossip mongers. I guess that they just only know very little and want to stay with what they think they know. Man, you want to talk about the push. Meltzer would write the lineup for the second King of the ring tournament on June 19th from the Baltimore arena is starting to take shape. The two non-tournament matches will be Bret Hart versus diesel for the WWF title. He talks about what the other one is, but either way, it's a big move for diesel to be facing Bret Hart in the, in, in a world title match, just weeks after winning the intercontinental. I mean, at this point. Do you guys start to think maybe we found our new Hulk Hogan? You give him the big push at the rumble right after WrestleMania. You make him the intercontinental champion to kick the summer off. He's working with the world champ. This is mashing the gas. Well, again, I, I don't, even at this point with diesel, we weren't thinking baby face. We, we still were not thinking baby face. You're looking at a big monster heel and obviously the, the hotter the heel, the hotter the baby face will be. But from a creative standpoint, we're still looking at him as a big, nasty monster heel. When the match happens at King of the Ring 94, Diesel picks up a win by DQ. So Brett's going to retain the title. But it's 22 minutes and 51 seconds. Uh, Meltzer would write considering Diesel was working much longer than he's ever had to on a major card and was working with a torn groin. He deserves praise for at least being good enough that Hart could carry him. I mean, this is pretty special to be on pay-per-view against the world champ. One of the best wrestlers there ever was in Bret Hart. And you get a three and three quarter star match. It's pretty remarkable. Well, it is, but it also speaks to the art of Bret Hart and Bret taking the challenge and saying, yeah, I'll get a match out of him. And if you're going to be in the ring with anybody, and you look at the list of opponents, um, I'm not taking anything away from Razor Ramon because, good Lord, Razor was incredible. Um, but Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels, shit, man. If you're not going to learn there, then you're dead. get out of the business. Yeah. This match ending is a nice story, too. Um, Diesel's going to give Bret the jackknife, and then Neidhart jumps in the ring and attacks him for the DQ which leaves the story sort of open-ended. Like we don't know if Brett would have been able to kick out of the jackknife. So pretty cool deal here. You and, don't know either. And it's, it's, it's a testament to Bret Hart that some of the best matches that every wrestler ever had were with Bret Hart. And this is another example of that. Um, 
Meltzer would write Davy boy Smith was called to return for the European tour in September. While it's not definite, it'll probably happen. But was there any talk of him returning prior to September? Kevin Nash called vicious up and told him the office was interested in bringing him up, but that he should call first. So there's lots of moving and shaking, but it, I do find it interesting that Kevin Nash is boys with Sid here. Do you remember there being a conversation, a conversation with Sid about Kevin Nash, maybe suggesting, Hey, you should call the office. I don't know how much Kevin had to do with it, but I, you know, I remember the time looking at Sid and thinking, Hmm, it's time to experiment with Sid one more time. And we did, you know, look, we asked talent what their thoughts were. Hey, do you think you can have a program with Sid? What do you think of Sid? Is there any heat here? And, and just, uh, go from there. But, you know, Kevin may have had something to do with it just from an interest point of view, but I do remember from our point, our point of view was let's, let's roll the dice on again. Um, it would, it would be written in, in late August, 94, that Sean had an altercation with a fan at the Portland tapings quote, no reports seemed to indicate how it got started, but diesel had to hold Sean back after the fan heckled Michael's and got under his skin. And then Michael shot back. I mean, this is the first time we hear of, believe it or not, diesel being, you know, the cooler head, uh, Sean occasionally would be rather emotional and, and volatile. And Kevin's going to sort of keep him in check. Is this the first, it feels like this is the first of, of many times we would hear stories like this, where Kevin Nash is trying to just keep everything even keel. So a heel got into a verbal argument with a fan in attendance and another heel held the heel back. That's news. It is a 94. Okay. There's a SummerSlam preview going down with Razor Ramon versus Diesel with uh, Walter Payton and Shawn Michaels in respective corners. And uh, it's teasing an intercontinental title change. And then we get the match. Uh, Razor Ramon captures the IC from Diesel in 15 minutes and two seconds in a match with the uh, NFL Hall of Fame running back Walter Payton in Ramon's corner as like the local sports tie in because this show goes down in Chicago. Uh, the match itself gets uh, two and three quarter stars. And after the match, Payton and his son are going to celebrate in the ring uh, with uh, Razor while they're once again teasing the Shawn Michaels diesel breakup. It was also worth mentioning sort of on the March towards this pay-per-view, you guys have Sean and diesel appear on Regis and Kathy Lee. What can you tell us about, uh, diesel sort of being a PR guy for you guys? I mean, this is going to be a big part of your role as a, as a, as a top guy, you're going to have to do the media circuit. You're going to have to be a good brand ambassador for the company. You're going to have to present yourself well. And everything we know about Kevin Nash now, uh, is that we know he can handle that. No problem. But how reluctant were you to get that started in 94 before you really knew what he was capable of in that regard? I'm not reluctant at all. Again, I, I subscribe to the same theory of you put people out there that are going to stand out in a crowd. You don't put the average looking guy on TV with average looking people. You put your larger than life so that no matter what they do, no matter what happens on the show, people are still going to say, holy shit, did you see that guy? Mm-hmm. Um, that, that was the criteria. And that was diesel had that box checked easily. Uh, in addition to that, He had a pretty dry sense of humor and the gift of gab. So you got to start somewhere. August 28th, the day before SummerSlam is when we would see Sean and diesel win the tag titles. What's the thinking here? You know, we've already got, um, diesel as the, as the intercontinental champion, we know he's going to drop it the next night to razor, but coming out of that, I guess we want to have them with a fresh angle. And maybe if there is a a storyline twist of maybe they're not getting along, that seems like age old wrestling storytelling. Hey, they're tag champs, but they don't really like each other. Right. 
Yeah, but they do like each other. It's just, it's like a marriage. They're going through a rough spot. And as far as, you know, doing it on a live event was, you always got to tell that story. You always have to keep it alive that anything can happen in the live events. It reminds people that we're a touring company. When we come to your hometown, by God, you better not miss it because that could be the night that Adam Bomb wins. In late September in White Plains, they're doing a challenge and action zones tapings, and they tape three different action zone matches, all of which were said to be great matches with uh, Michaels and Diesel keeping the tag titles when they would beat Razor Ramon and One Two Three Kid. Uh, fans have recently rediscovered that match in or these series of matches in more recent years and absolutely love them. How much do these guys enjoy working with each other? I mean, these are the foundations of the click four best friends are doing what they do best. Yeah. Anytime you get to work with your buddy or your, you know, your friends, it's first of all, it's easier, but it's just a shitload more fun. And that comes across in your performance. We so, should yeah, work with their buddies. They loved it. Let's just take a pause here and, and keep in mind that we'll call it early to mid October at this point in the year, Brett's the champion. He's being built to face Bob Backlund with Owen Hart right behind him. Diesel and Sean are tag champions. Fast forward several weeks and Diesel's going to pin Backlund in six seconds. And Diesel is a babyface champion. When were the wheels put in motion for that? Because it does feel like it happens very quickly from this point. It did happen quickly. And there was, um, a groundswell, if you will, of whatever diesel was doing. The, the audience was, was buying in and popping for it. the, the audience, they, they were ready for him at that point. And no matter what we did, the audience wasn't going to accept him in any other way other than a badass baby face. So you're left with the dilemma of do you turn him now or do you wait and fight the tide? And a lot of times, you know, we would wait and fight the tide. This was an opportunity to to go for it. Um, business was what it was, and if you're going to do new wanted to do new before the push to WrestleMania and let's get out there. Let's give it a shot. And sometimes you go through those periods where it's like, fuck man, let's just try something new and see what, see what holds. This was that opportunity. Let's, uh, let's talk about it. It comes out in the observer on the 5th of December. Diesel became the latest attempt to recreate a Hulk Hogan by capturing the WWF title from Bob Backlund in just eight seconds with a jackknife power bomb on November 26th at Madison square garden. The title switch came just three days after survivor series where Backlund had won the title from Brett and diesel had turned baby face on partner, Shawn Michaels. The quickie title change was largely given away to anyone who could read between the lines on TV Saturday, both nationally and locally in the New York market. On the USA Network's WBF Mania show, it was announced there would be a title match between Backlund and Diesel, replacing the quote unquote injured Bret Hart at the Garden, and that the WWF would open its 900 number line for live commentary of that match starting at 9 30 p.m. Eastern Time. In the New York market, the title change was telegraphed even deeper by announcing that the match was no DQ, no count out, and no submissions, therefore rendering Backlund's finishing chicken wing maneuver useless Backlund also did an interview for the New York market complaining that he had trained to wrestle Bret Hart, not diesel at a crowd that was announced or estimated at rather 7,300 Howard Finkel made the announcement of the match, but stated in a tease that it would be a non title match and then corrected himself after a supposed change of plans given to him by agent Rene Goulet. Earlier in the show, Backlund did a live interview to a chorus of heavy boos, claiming that he would be a much better moral leader than Bret Hart while fans chanted for both Bret and Diesel. The match itself was short as it needed to be because of who was in there with all the fireworks adding to the huge crowd reaction for the title change. Later in the show, Diesel came out to thank the fans amongst another barrage of fireworks, and he was called the leader of the new generation on Monday Night Raw 
live on November 28th. Nash, who was 35 and billed at seven foot tall. By the way, he was listed at six, nine when he played basketball. He grew <laughs> is a Michigan native who played. He was co- stretched early on and he grew. So he's given, you know, sort of the background, uh, but here's the, here's the story. 14 months after you guys bring him in to be a bodyguard. Well, he's the world champ. It's a great story, isn't it? It really is. You know, when you really think about it, it's, uh, it's a raw, he has a story like not a lot of other folks, just tremendous. The, uh, the thinking and doing it this way is we want to give diesel a try with the strap. We want to make him our top guy. We want to feature him, but we're not ready to just take the belt, have him take the belt off of Brett. So we, we interject Bob Backlund as sort of a, um, transitional champion, if you will, but he's someone who has credibility. And it's funny because in that era, we looked at Backlund as being a quote unquote old man. He's only 45. I mean, some of the top stars in WWE and, and wrestling all over are older than that. Uh, but he's also the former WWF champ from 78 to 83. So he has Ed a lot was of one of the hottest heels in the, in the, in the business at the time. I guess what I'm driving at is. Okay. Well, two can play that game. Okay. There we go. Let's do it. Let's talk about it. Why the pivot away from Brett? You know, it feels like Vince was trying to make Brett the next Hulk Hogan. And you've often talked about here on the show that internally you guys would say, what would we do if it was Hulk? The idea being, let's not change the way we market or present our main attraction or our top star or our champion. Let's keep doing it the same way. But it can't be argued that business is not exactly booming under Brett's title reign for whatever reason. It's just not having the same success that maybe they had with Hulk Hogan before. And maybe the business is cyclical, which feels a little bit like a cop out, but it is something that's been said in wrestling for a long time. Maybe fans just weren't into Bret Hart. Maybe they did want a more larger than life sized individual as opposed to a great technical wrestler. Is that the thinking on Vince's side? I mean, if you had to get into his head of why he would pivot Let's forget Bob for a minute. Why he would pivot from Brett to diesel. Is it because he thought, well, they're just not buying the great technical wrestler. He'll still be near the top of the cards, but we've got to have a, a monster, uh, a larger than life individual to be our new sort of Hulk Hogan. Well, the, the answer to that is business was not good and we did need to make a change. You look at your roster, you have your players, and you've got to be able to play with what you have. Looking at the list of people on there, you know, Razor Ramon was considered. Um, But Kevin was hot. Uh, Diesel, that character, he was red hot at the time. And that was based on the other things that we were doing with him. You know, where he wasn't even necessarily featured. Um, but he, you know, the, the experiment putting him with Sean and doing that, it, it, it was working because he was over and he was getting to the point where he was probably the most popular guy on the card each and every night. Uh, business, nobody was setting anything on fire. And, and it's interesting, you know, because we have talked about, you know, what would we do if it was Hulk? With right. the Brett deal, I think that that changed here from the standpoint of Hulk's Hulk, Warrior was Warrior, Savage was Savage. Um, we have to we have to treat each individual because if everybody's treated like Hulk, then everybody's going to be compared to Hulk. Hulk. Right. And here we are in in two thousand and twenty. And I think people are still compared to Hulk because Hulk was the first Hulk was the biggest at the time. And, and just the, the longevity of Hulkamania and the phenomenon that is Hulk Hogan. So 
it was easy to compare. This was a point where, right or wrong, that they were, we at least we were looking at, let's do what we would do for diesel and try that route. This episode of Something to Wrestle with Bruce Pritchard is brought to you by Car Shield, which makes it easy and affordable to protect my car from expensive repairs. And that, well, that's just for starters. You see, Car Shield is the number one auto protection company in the U.S. and offers protection plans for around 100 bucks a month. The plans cover more parts than ever before, whether your car has 5,000 miles or maybe even more like 150,000 miles. And I cannot stress enough how simple it is to get your car fixed. When you need a repair, you're the one that gets to choose the mechanic, and Car Shield's administrators handle all of the rest. That is it. You don't have to deal with the paperwork or the headaches you are taken care of. I'm not exaggerating when I say this. I was in a car accident back in last September, and it took two months alone just taking care of the paperwork to even get my car in the shop. With Car Shield, you do not need to worry about that. And the same goes if your car breaks down and you're stuck on the side of the road. Plans through CarShield include coast-to-coast roadside assistant. And CarShield administrators are there for you with rental car options as well and trip reimbursement at no extra cost. Get coverage today and you'll lock in your price right now. And I promise you this, it will never go up. That means as long as you own your car, no matter how old it is, you are protected from the rising costs of parts and repairs for your vehicle. Car Shield helps protect my wallet from expensive car repairs, and they're going to do the same for you as well. Go to carshield.com slash podcast to start your plan and lock in your pricing forever. That's carshield.com slash podcast. A deductible may apply. Well, they do. I guess we should mention that uh, there's a big tease happening. Uh, right before this goes down at the survivor series. And it's about whether or not diesel really is a good guy. And if you were watching at home and you showed up at MSG, maybe you had a different opinion of diesel. So the way we're getting him ready for this world title thing is with one of those elimination matches at survivor series. It's the bad guys on one side, the teamsters on the other, the bad guys are razor Ramon, one, two, three kid, Davy boy, and the head shrinkers. Across from them, the Teamsters, that's Shawn Michaels, Diesel, Owen Hart, Jim Neidhart, and Jeff Jarrett. Of course, somewhere in here, there's real problems. Uh, Shawn Michaels is going to throw the tag wheel on the ground and, and make it clear he wants nothing to do with Diesel again. And Meltzer would be critical of this in his write-up. Uh, I think, uh, let me find the phrase that he uses here. Uh, it wasn't exactly uh, overwhelmingly positive. The diesel turn was well done. Although the match was a major disappointment. None of the matches were particularly good. And the second match was particularly awful. While most liked the heart backland title match. I was bored to death by it for the first 25 minutes. Meltzer was, was a little critical of, of Brett and backland, but he did think that maybe this turn, this split, this breakup, which everybody knew at this point was inevitable with Sean and diesel. I don't know. It was a little less than ideal. What'd you think of the way everything went down with, uh, diesel and Sean at survivor series? Again, it's a chapter in a story. So I thought it was well done because it got people talking and it was a natural progression of the story. So to take the next step, you, you've got to have, you've got to have spats along the way. And this was one of those spats along the way. Let's keep it going. Let's talk about what's going to happen with diesel. Now that he has the world title and seemingly he's got real problems with, uh, Sean Michaels, we're back doing a live raw on the 28th and, um, diesel does an interview, which Meltzer says was entirely too long. And he says, quote, he isn't as smooth at all at trying to be a baby face. That isn't to say it's not going to work. But if the diesel thing is going to work, they have to be careful and leave it in short doses like 911 and ECW because it won't work if they keep the matches and interview if they don't keep the matches and interview short. His weaknesses will be exposed if they aren't careful. 
And uh, a great deal of his charisma was his ability to stand there and do nothing and take the rub off of Michaels. The gist of it was he'd give Bret Hart a title shot. This is interesting commentary here, I guess, in that we're saying, Hey, we do have somebody who has a real upside and real potential, but maybe he's not ready to go out there and do a long interview all by himself. Is that a fair criticism? Do you think at this point uh, of his run? I think that what we did with him was not good. Um, this is another example of, um, and I'm going to pick on Jim Ross here for a second. And, and, um, we, all of a sudden we went from characters and you went from what was cool and what the, the audience was buying, which was diesel is an ass kicking heel. Since he wins the title, has a spat with Sean. He becomes this jokester and, and hey, Bobby Backlund, bow tie Bob, and um, shit like that. Leading the office, singing Christmas carols, and stop being diesel. He does an interview where JR talks about, yeah, now I got your. You played basketball in, in Tennessee and you and all the now Kevin. I, I I didn't want fucking Kevin Nash. Kevin Nash wasn't the guy the audience fell in love with. They fell in love with the nasty heel diesel. When you go back and you look at uh you look at the history and you go back and you watch old tapes and old shows and everything, Hulk Hogan was a terrible human being. He cheated. Yes. Uh, he didn't take his, his. He didn't take calls from his friends because he was working out. Um. But the biggest baby face in the world. He was a heel. Stone Cold Steve Austin was a heel. That's why they loved him. Diesel was a heel, and we made him. We we took Diesel away from him. Jr. starts calling him Kevin. I don't know who the fuck Kevin is. I don't care who Kevin is. I cared about my guy Diesel. And when we humanized him, I think that at that moment, Diesel lost all of his momentum when we made him champion the first time as a babyface and tried to present him as a legitimate athlete that with legitimate credentials Nobody gives a fuck. Nobody gives a fuck. They want to be entertained. They want characters. And there are people that want the legitimacy. Well, then go to something legitimate. If you want story and entertainment, then that's what we're trying to give. And, and it, when it got to be a departure from what we had been doing, I think that's where we lost them. I think that that's where it just became. I I don't, I don't want Kevin from Tennessee. I want diesel. I want the badass. Well, but let's talk about that. I mean, isn't this something that Vince would have had to co-sign or did Jr. just really, he did co-sign it. And that's in and again, it sucked. It sucked. He did. And, and, you know, they're, they're different factions pushing different things. Um, I, I made the argument and I was countered with, you know, God damn, you got to be real. And, you know, I, you know, we've, we've got to present him in a different way and all this other shit. And I was like, yeah, okay. But that's not the guy that we've been presenting all this time. That's not the guy the audience got behind that made us say, hmm, maybe we've got a baby face on our hands. Maybe we've got a guy that we can push and make larger than life. We took him from being a larger than life character and made him the guy next door that goes to college and plays basketball. Wasn't good enough to go pro. Didn't play for a major university. 
And I'm not knocking anybody that plays college athletics in any way, shape, or form because that's a different level than, you know, hey, by God, I made the high school football team or the basketball team. Hell of an athlete. But if I want to watch a mediocre basketball player, you can watch that all day long somewhere. If I want a larger-than-life kick-ass fucking diesel, that's my guy. Not the guy that fucking went, you know, in a dorm in East Tennessee and the idea. I being, just hated it. If I he fucking was, hated it. The, I think what you're driving at is if the guy was Michael Jordan, then let's exploit that. But if he wasn't, right. then let's make him the Michael Jordan of this. Okay. Just freestyling. Yeah. Let's no, start. yeah. I mean that that's that's true. If, if he was okay, look, if he were Kurt Angle in college, that's different, you know. That's different. But go ahead, you know, it's like it's like saying, well, you know, I went to San Jacinto Junior College and um man, I was a professor at San Jacinto Junior College in Houston, Texas. Okay, I had tenure there. And you were doing this while you were I never I never went a day to I would never went one day to college. <laughs> but yet but yet I taught karate. Yeah. San Jack junior college and, and fuck, you know, come on. Wait, you actually talk karate. Conrad. I know I'm Cur- a three time black belt hall of famer. I just assumed that meant you wrote three checks. I mean, there's actually some kids out there who think they're badasses because of you. Yeah. As a matter of fact, Daniel Knight, I took him and made him turn him into a badass. Now he's like a badass lawyer. Uh, he was one of my students when he was five years old in Friendswood, Texas, which was the first class that I had. Um, on down the line, man, it's a whole fucking list of them. Wait, hang on. You were teaching five year olds how to. Th- there's so much we got to talk yes. about this another time. Oh, yeah, man. Dude, l- let me tell you something. Uh, Bill Gray and the American Society of Karate, they knew what they had. Okay. But yet I don't dwell on my three time Black Belt Hall of Fame career uh, in that world because now. Uh, I'm in another world. I don't talk about starting karate in 1970 and getting my black belt and three-time black belt hall of famer and teaching karate and all of those things like that. You know why? Cause nobody gives a fuck. Okay. Listen, they do take some of the, uh, um, some of what, what, what Meltzer said, Hey, this might work if we keep it short. That's actually what you guys wound up doing. The first tour of house show dates happens in upstate New York and in all three cities, diesel beats Bob Backlund in 30 seconds. And then Jack knives, both Owen Hart and Jim Neidhart. When they do post-match run-ins, he leaves all three laying. He gets huge pops when they come out. And when he leaves them laying, you know why Jack knows? Jack knife those two guys. Why? Because after Bob Backlund took that first jack knife in the in the garden, he said he's never going to fucking do that to me again. Really? Yeah, Bob wouldn't take any more of those jack knives. Is that a real story? That's a real story. Bobby didn't like the way that he landed him and and let him go and landed right on his tailbone and said he's not. I'm not doing that ever again. Wow. Look, you know, th- it's been written. Let's just talk about it. That, uh, well, I don't know that we agree with this. I don't think I do. I think there's enough evidence otherwise. And I don't think it's necessarily a fair statement, if it, even if it were true. But Diesel has often been referred to as the worst drawing champion in WWF history. And in my notes, I want to ask, when did you start to notice a dip in house show business? But if you remember when he won the fucking thing at MSG, there's only 7,000 fans there and 7,000 fans in Huntsville would be a hell of a house. 7,000 fans in Madison square garden means you probably lost money running the damn building. Uh, chat me up. When did you, or did you notice that business started to take a dip? Because that certainly became the narrative. And I'm sure we're going to talk about that for the rest of this episode about whether or not that was a fair criticism. I, I think it was a fair criticism, but business overall was the shits. Kevin was just the mascot for it. But I mean, um, it, you started this by saying 
yeah, we made the switch. We needed to get it off of Brett because business was down. So it's right. not like he inherited this gold mine. We're not fresh off WrestleMania nope. five. And then diesel just spiraled it. The shit's already going down and we're starting to look for other alternatives. What about this? And unfortunately that wasn't the magic bullet. Yes. And, and people put the heat on, on diesel. Uh, I did. I, I remember the, the night that we went to shoot the angle with gold dust and razor in Portland, Maine or Bangor, Maine. Um, and Vince was in with razor and gold dust or whatever. And I'm outside with, with Hunter and diesel and diesel says, you know, I'm the, the lowest earning WWF champion of all time. I said, well, it goes hand in hand with the lowest drawing WWF champion. And Kevin and I had a few heated words at that point. And you, you look back and, and it's true. Yeah. The, the business, but you can't, when you truly look at it in hindsight and you look at it with fresh eyes in a fair assessment, he didn't inherit. No, he didn't inherit anything. He inherited, uh, the championship at a time where the business was at a low point and there wasn't an awful lot, you know, for him to work with from that point moving ahead. And I think that as time went on, diesel did become a draw and he did get into a position where yes, he did draw money and obviously did well enough that he was able to parlay that into a hell of a deal at WCW. So as much as, you know, I've picked on Kevin before and I picked on, you know, diesel and all that shit, make no mistake about it. Um, you can't put all of it on him and he was doing what he was told. He was still green and doing what he was told. And that falls on us. That falls on us the, from the creative people that, that were, were allowing it to ha happen. And, and I was a part of that. And as much as I <laughs> would say, God damn, man, we got to get back to diesel. Nobody gives a shit about Kevin. Um, eventually we did. And I do think that when we, we finally got back to that asshole kick ass diesel, that it made a difference. I really do. Because then people, you know, what you gave him, you gave him his edge back and gave him his assholiness back. They cared. Let's, That's uh, just me. Let's talk about two things here in the observer in, in late December, it's written on television this past weekend, the WWF announced the Royal rumble on January 22nd in Tampa, Florida, a main event of diesel versus Bret Hart for the title. My guess is they will try and run a storyline and portray Hart very subtly as a heel, because if they don't it try to lead the fans, there is the possibility of Hart getting the majority of cheers or even a split mixed response, which would kill everything they're trying to get across right now. I think that's a fair criticism. I mean, Bret Hart's been your biggest baby face for years at this point. And if you're going to put him in there against diesel, who you're trying to get over as the new hot baby face, maybe that's not the wisest decision. And it would lead, I think to a lot of people internally questioning it. At least that's according to Dave Meltzer on January 9th of 95 in the observer, he would write, there's already a lot of talk within the company that diesel isn't the answer. And the idea of going with Backlund on top was a fiasco blamed on Patterson. I don't know if they'll do a change to Hart or Michaels. My feeling is they've got WrestleMania plans locked in, whatever they are. Whatever changes in direction will be made won't really go into effect until the new season in late April. He's talking about after WrestleMania, of course. At the house shows this past weekend, they had Sean doing live Heartbreak Hotels, where he pushed the idea of him winning the title at Mania, which seems awfully early to push something like that, particularly since they don't want to be giving stuff away. It's beginning to look like Hart may wind up like Flair as a 10 time champion because he'll constantly be replaced and shoved aside for the latest new monster. And as soon as his successor can't hang once put in the spotlight, they go back to the solid guy. Lots to unpack here. What do you make of Meltzer's write up here when he's saying that maybe the office 
isn't sold on diesel as the top guy. And some people are even questioning whether or not Backlund was the right transitional champion or the right guy to take it off of Brett. <laughs> well, I, again, I think it was way too soon to, to judge at this point. And the funny thing, blame being put on Pat Patterson is hilarious because that was something that we all talked about. And that blame can be shared if you want to call it blame, but that decision was shared amongst all three of us. And that was a decision that we, you know, pondered and went over tremendously, you know, a tremendous amount of time, just kind of thinking about it. What could we do? So that, that doesn't go on Pat and it was an experiment and it's, Something that I, I don't think, again, business business was just not good. Um, we didn't have anything they wanted to see. We just, you know, there, there wasn't there wasn't anything hot that had really captured the imagination of the audience at this point. So you're you're looking for for different things to hit and throwing a lot of shit at the wall. That's just the facts. We should mention, even though there is some, some criticism here internally for diesel fans were st- smart fans who, who read the observer. We're starting to get behind him a little bit. Uh, an honorable man. That, that well, I'm just saying he got, uh, most improved. He's first place there. He's an honorable mention for most charismatic. Him and Sean uh, are a huge vote and an honorable mention for tag team of the year. Uh, he's an honorable mention for best gimmick. I mean, there's some positive stuff, you know, fans are, are starting to come around on him is, is my point. Royal rumble 95. Here we go. Diesel retains the WWF title going to a no decision with Bret Hart in 27 minutes and 19 seconds. This is uh, an incredible story Four and a quarter stars. Of course, there's going to be lots of of silliness here with Shawn Michaels doing a run in Owen Hart coming down, uh, eventually Shawn, Owen, Backlund, Jarrett, Rhodey, they're all doing run ins and attacking both guys. Uh, it's, um, apparent that Bret Hart can have a great match with diesel here, but a schmaz finish, which makes me wonder why book it in the first place. What's the thinking here? It's an interesting matchup. And you want you didn't want to give away your WrestleMania attractions yet. We're trying to get to Brett and Backlund at WrestleMania, and Diesel and Sean. So you don't want to you don't want to put out your, your WrestleMania attractions here. So you got to do something in the interim. And it was an interesting match that you couldn't call. Let's talk about something that comes out. Oh, by the way, uh, even though we sometimes say, "Oh man, that finish." Four and a quarter stars here. If you're just wanting to see what diesel was capable of here in early 95, go watch this Brett match. It is a very good match. Of course, you know, we know that Brett's probably the architect for that, but the point is together, they can have a great match. Yeah. Brett, Brett was the architect of it. However, you know, say what you will. Diesel was able to go in and follow and do it and pull it off. Tremendous little write up from the observer in early February. And it's about the. Uh, how do you pronounce the NATPE convention? The NATPE? NATPE. Yeah. They did that in Vegas, January 24th through the 26th with the idea being WCW would hold a major event, get the major TV executives there and show off a hot product with Hulk Hogan and the macho man. And Meltzer would write, while it didn't appear that there were any TV types there with the exception of two or three faces like Mitch Ackerman from Disney that are there for all the big shows all the time. Anyway, WCW did seem to come out strong from a psychological standpoint at the convention, because for the first year in history, they stole the spotlight from the WWF Titan flew in big wigs like Vince McMahon, diesel undertaker, and Jim Ross in from Florida on the red eye after the raw taping Monday night. And they were in Vegas on Tuesday afternoon. According to those who were there, diesel was walking around. He did turn heads because he was in costume and at his size, well, he's going to turn heads, but nobody knew who he was. WCW got much larger crowds to the Turner booth with Hulk Hogan and Randy Savage, who everyone knew. Of course, Bischoff even gave a speech where he talked about WCW as being where the stars are and knocked the WWF saying they're 
stars are, are mid card cast offs like diesel. And now he's a world champion there when couldn't exactly hack it in WCW. Uh, Meltzer would say, and although I was told it was embarrassing to witness the interview Lauren Hutton did with Hogan garnered a lot of attention. There were no lines for autographs of diesel undertaker or McMahon, but there were huge lines for Savage. And of course, Hulk Hogan WCW officials were openly talking about smoking Titan at the convention by Thursday. When foot traffic was down, Ross and Shane McMahon were in the Titan booth with the bushwhackers, Mr. Fuji, etc looking like a Maytag repairman group while crowds flocked to the booth where the blade warriors were doing an exhibition just a few feet away. WWF is still far and away. Number one in the U S but it didn't look like this in that venue. What do you remember about this convention and, and seemingly WCW showing up the WWF for the first time? Well, they definitely had big crowd there for Hulk Hogan and to that, you know, I would sure as hell hope they would after all the time that he was spent being built in the WWE. So it, it's, yeah, uh, goddamn, I would, I would hope they would at the same time, having no crowd for no line for undertaker diesel. Um, that's just a blatant flat out lie. I was there. I don't know if, uh, Mr. Gossip monger dirt sheet writer was there or not. Um, but I was, and there were lines for them. So that's just a, a difference in facts. Let's, uh, let's keep it going. And, and something comes out in the observer, uh, the next week that I think you've already touched on diesel is participating in a celebrity slam dunk contest in conjunction with the NBA all-star game this week. And is also in an MTV softball game and judging from a lengthy interview at raw, where they called him Kevin Nash and tried to put him over as a real person, as opposed to a cartoon character, they look to be committed to building the company around him in the same type of interview McMahon did with Hulk Hogan before his match with Sid justice. And again, when he came back 10 months later after the steroid controversy, Even the normally conservative Japanese mags are calling him a box office failure. So the rap is already out fair or not just two months into his run. Oh, this isn't working. I don't know how much of that is really his fault or fair, but I I do like that. They reference that big sit down interview that Kevin Nash does with Vince McMahon. It's got like the, the studio look, what do you remember about that interview in particular? I I have to assume you were there helping shoot this, this promo. I was, and I hated it. Absolutely. I said before, I, I, I hated it. I didn't think that it was the right way to go. Um, I was outvoted if you will, because that's, that's the way we went and got on board and did it. But. Um, I hate it then. I hate it now. I don't think it was the right direction to go. And I think history will bear me out. It, it, it took the mystique off of diesel. So I, again, I just, I'm not a, <laughs> I'm not a, a college basketball fan. I'm not a basketball fan. I don't give two shits about basketball. Uh, I enjoy football, but I really don't care that much about if, you know, Tim Tebow had chosen to go into wrestling instead of baseball. uh, I don't know. I don't know that I really would have been that interested. I don't know. I just, I never got the, hey, he was great in another sport or he played in another sport in a small college somewhere. Okay, great. A lot of people do make him larger than life. That's I just, yeah, I, I, I hated it. And the fact that Japanese wrestling magazines, well, who gives a um, shit about that? No, I don't care about that, but it, it, it is just so weird that Vince buys into this, you know, Kevin Nash instead of diesel thing. It's such a departure. Like I can't imagine them sitting down with Jim Helwig. You know what I mean? Right. Exactly. Great example. Like what the fuck? You just, you're not invested in, you're not invested in him. We, we, we invested in diesel. We spent the last whatever year and a half 
on Diesel. Not Kevin Nash. Now all of a sudden you're telling me he's just a guy that went to college and played some basketball? Yeah. And that's your, your focus? Eh. In this era, uh, Dave would take questions in the Observer uh, where fans would write him and then he would, you know, write a response. He got a question from, uh, does he still? Cause I'd like to send him a question. <laughs> he got a question from Maryland that says, do you think the WWF made a prudent move in making diesel champion? Personally, I feel Vince McMahon has sacrificed his strongest drawing card in Bret Hart. And Dave replies, the situation in comparing the two is this Bret Hart will never be a super drawing card. Diesel probably won't be either. But when the decision was made, nobody knew that Titan as always was looking to create a new Hulk Hogan and clearly Bret Hart will never be that person. Nobody else may be for a long time, but someone saw this gigantic guy was getting great crowd reactions as a heel and appeared to have a lot of charisma. So at the time it looked to be at least a decent gamble and nobody ever struck gold in pro wrestling without having to gamble on pushing unknowns to the moon at one point or another. Usually it doesn't work, but all you need is one success. Thus far, it hasn't succeeded, but Hart also hasn't been sacrificed. If it doesn't work, they can always go back to Hart in a credible manner. I know that you hate Dave Meltzer's assessment a lot of times, but dude, he just hit the nail on the head here. Did he know it? Yeah, he did. The build to WrestleMania 11 is now on. It looks like diesel is going to be the headliner because he's the champion, but perhaps some of the criticism or maybe the poor houses or whatever. That's what I want you to fill in the gaps for. If diesel's our guy, why do we then say, okay, we're going to have him on top. We're going to have him in a world title match. We're going to have him working with Sean. It will be a great match, but it's not going on last. We need a little celebrity injection. We're going to go bam, bam, Lawrence Taylor. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just curious. Do you think. Did, did Vince feel that was necessary because the house, because the houses weren't up? I mean, if, if diesel would have came in and instead of having 7,000 at the garden, now we've got 12,000. Do you think it would have been necessary to, to, to go find Lawrence Taylor and put him in the ring with bam, bam, Bigelow, or maybe yes, that still would have happened, but it would have went on in the middle of the card or second to last, but it wouldn't have closed the show. Well, again, Lawrence Taylor was news at that point. Lawrence was a big deal. So, especially in that market, um, nationally, more people knew who LT was than, than did Kevin Nash or Diesel and uh, Shawn Michaels. So, as far as getting the word out there and publicity and getting people talking about the event, it that was the bigger draw. And no, you know, Diesel and, and Sean weren't setting the world on fire and business was down. So, yeah, you, you go with the business decision and the bigger story was LT in a wrestling ring. What can you tell us about the big press conference that you guys did with Lawrence Taylor and Bam Bam Bigelow? And of course, Sean and Diesel are there, but it almost feels like some of the, the other mainstream media, maybe even the AP, they're going to say they're going to list both guys as being wrestlers, but not really focus on them. I mean, the focus is all on Lawrence Taylor and bam, bam Bigelow. And oh yeah. In the background, we got a world title match too. And th these are those guys. That's what it was designed to be. And we, we knew what buttons that we had to push to get that national attention and to be able to get the publicity that we were looking for. I guess what I'm so, trying to drive at is, and I don't mean this to, to be weird that I keep belaboring the point, but I don't feel like maybe I'm communicating it properly. When you did this at WrestleMania 14, yes, Shawn Michaels was there and he's a big star, but what everybody was really focused on was Mike Tyson and Steve Austin. And I can't help but wonder, could there have been a way to perhaps have a similar story here where if we've got a commitment from Lawrence Taylor, that he's going to work a match, could he work a match with Kevin Nash and have Shawn Michaels as a ref or some shit like that? 
Yeah, you could have, but LT was a god in, in that market and, and had just retired and was a baby face. And you're not going to put your top baby face against the top baby face outside of your world. So, again, different attractions. Well, okay. Tyson, the, the, Tyson fit into the main storyline with Stephen Chong. Because Tyson was a natural heel, but it also a, a major attraction. But you could have at the same time maybe put Lawrence Taylor in the Mr. T spot, right? Maybe it would be Diesel and and um, Lawrence you Taylor. You could have, but the idea was to use LT's star to bring viewers in to expose all of our other talent and to be able to expose these and John Michaels and not where, okay, before you're going to get to the LT, we used LT. So before you get to LT, you're going to sit through what we were hoping to be a great match. And it was a damn good match, uh, with diesel and Sean. I'm not arguing that at all. It was a good match. I just wonder if we're really trying to, to push Kevin Nash as our, and we're really behind him. And we're not second guessing our decision. I just wonder if it was Hulk, what would we do? Would we have Hulk wrestle right before and then let Big Boss but Man it, work with Lawrence? It wasn't Taylor? Hulk. And you wanted people to watch him. So if you put for the, the majority of the people, again, you're trying to get to a new audience. So if you want to expose it to a new audience and you put what that new audience is tuning in to see, they've seen it. Now they're going to go away. Ah, I've seen LT and okay. But now I'm disinterested in the rest of the shit versus you sit there and you make them watch everything else before they get to LT. If that's why they're there. And along the way, you expose them to the rest of your product. So you're putting your champion and you're putting the guy that you're trying to build around in the optimum position, because now to the casual fan, that's only may only be tuning in for LT. I've watched everything else. And God damn, did you see that big bastard? Diesel, holy shit, I, I got to watch more of that. Versus, okay, I saw LT click. Now they don't get the opportunity to witness Diesel and Shaw. Let's talk about the TV tapings on the way to WrestleMania. Uh, Meltzer would say Diesel did an interview with Vince. McMahon was carrying the interview, uh, which was going nowhere with Diesel saying things like if Shawn Michaels played baseball, he would have hit 400 and calling Shawn the best athlete in the world today. Finally, Shawn and Sid come out and Michaels makes the interview basically saying, unlike Diesel, who had things given to him, he had to work his way up for seven years to reach this spot and promise the performance of a lifetime. Isn't it a little counterproductive for a heel to be saying this to a baby face? Yeah, I'm not crazy about that. Let's get to WrestleMania 11. Uh, the best match poll in the Observer had it as Shawn Michael and Diesel. No surprise there. Um, they get plenty of time. They get a four-star match. It's 20 minutes and 35 seconds. We've covered this a, a million different times, but diesel retains lots of celebrities. They threw everybody at it, uh, including Jenny McCarthy and of course, Pamela Anderson, but I mean, Nicholas Turturro and Jonathan Taylor Thomas. I mean, we're just crawling with celebrities. Uh, Sean is uh, a little irritated with all the ringside photographers. Uh, diesel would be critical of this match later saying Sean was trying to blow me up and he was trying to make me look bad and embarrass me. And he took my finish shitty. Uh, diesel was not really, uh, pleased with Sean sort of showing ass here, but they still had a four-star match, really good match. Um, what'd you think of this one? I thought it was a great match. And I thought that it, again, um, I, I don't think that. Sean was trying to show diesel up. I think that Sean was trying to get the best out of diesel and trying to push him to be the best that he could be. Um, but Sean stole the show. Yeah, he did. That's what Sean went out to do. That's what Sean does. He goes out to steal the fucking show and he did it here. I want to hit you with this melts word, right? The top foreign star today in, uh, j j the Japanese wrestling scene is Steve Williams. And he's the subject of much speculation after missing all Japan's second, most important tour of the year, the champion carnival tour. 
All that's known of the situation is that Williams arrived in Japan on March 20th, but returned home without leaving the airport. Rumors immediately began flying that he had either jumped to new Japan or the WWF. Although at the time, neither group had even made any contact with him to the best of our knowledge. It is known that the WWF is very interested in him as a top heel and that they are short on that side, even shorter now with recent turns, but he would likely be given a serious program with diesel. Do you remember Dr. Death even being discussed here in 95? No, no, I'm sure the, the, you know, Jim Ross would always want to have doc. Um, but no. Let's, um, let's talk about the, the post WrestleMania press conference. Uh, the company is going to claim that WrestleMania 11 would be the highest grossing wrestling event of all time, which Meltzer would say at no point was even a remote realistic prediction. And he says the final buy rate appears to have fallen short of even the most conservative predictions. And he says, depending on who you want to believe it gets somewhere between a 1.3 to a 1.8 buy rate. And at a cable convention the past weekend in LA, the fact that the show quote unquote flopped despite so much mainstream publicity was a leading topic of discussion. What do you remember about the disappointing WrestleMania 11 buy rate? And, and what did this, is there a lesson to be learned from WrestleMania 11? I mean, sometimes when, when there are missteps in business, we say things like, oh, this is a teachable moment. Did Vince have a takeaway from WrestleMania 11, perhaps being a, a bit of a disappointment? Uh, you know, I think that uh, it just wasn't good. It, it just overall the, the product and our business in general wasn't good. And we could have put the rematch of Hulk and Andre. And I don't know that it would have mattered. So, you know, the teachable moment there is. Sometimes life sucks <laughs> and, and yeah, uh, the, the LT stuff in, in that market, I think did do, it did do something and it meant something, but outside of the New York market and outside of the Northeast and outside of the true diehard NFL fan base. Yeah. Didn't, didn't mean that much. So yeah, you live and you learn. Meltzer would write the bad was they had no celebrity rub from LT or anyone else. They promoted the show and LT. Well, since the storyline started with LT meeting diesel at the NFL's 75th anniversary dinner, LT should have made more references to him at the press conference. Diesel should have been shown training LT diesel or anyone else for that matter should have come into the ring to share the victory spotlight at the end of the show. It was the celebrity rub that made Hogan a celebrity, and that's what they need to make Diesel the next Hogan. It was really bad that the biggest wrestling show of the year ended with not one wrestler in the ring. If Diesel helped LT get ready, then Diesel should be there at the end. Bad ending. It's kind of hard to disagree with, isn't it? No, because that's what, that's what we had built and that's what we, that's what we had promoted and that's what we delivered. Uh, let's talk about, uh, the April 24th, Monday night raw. It sets an all time record for diesel versus bam, bam for in a title match. It does a 3.9 rating, which translates to 2.28 million homes, the largest audience to watch pro wrestling in the U S since Hogan flair, uh, the prior August and Cedar Rapids for WCW other ratings that weekend were uh, like 1.7 for action zone and mania. This is, uh, maybe a little bit of evidence that WrestleMania worked because people believe in Bam Bam Bigelow was a legitimate threat for the title. I mean, a a 3.9 rating here. That's pretty damn good for all. Is it not? I guess. I mean, I, yes and no. I know primetime was doing better numbers in its heyday, uh, a different time, different places and the audience and the huts and all that. It's just, It's hard to compare, you know, it's apples and pomegranates sometimes. Let's talk about, yeah, I I look, I'm happy that, that, that match, that people care enough to tune in. Let's also mention in your house. One is uh, right around the corner. 
and we've just recently covered this uh, in the archives. The the worst match poll, Diesel and Sid. It's a runaway. Uh, Meltzer would say probably more important than the reaction was the light response. By far the lightest to any WWF pay per view in recent memory, which is a very preliminary indication that this experiment isn't off to a good start. The noticeable empty blotches of seats, even in the first elevated ringside section, right in front of the camera, indicated the same thing. The only match that seemed to have any real heat going in diesel versus Sid was also the worst match on the show. The idea of the top face versus the top heel with a decent storyline going in to a medium sized market that had never had a show of this caliber before. And the result is nowhere near a full building is a sign that the casual fan didn't think this was a major event, something that needs to happen. If this concept is to work as a show itself, I gave it a slight thumbs down. I had it a thumbs up before the main event, even in the middle as time was running out on the show, but doing an every Saturday WCW uninspired heel run in DQ as a pay-per-view world title main event made me give it a thumbs down. It gets three quarters of a star and he's referencing that Tatanka and Bam Bam Bigelow and lots of folks are involved here. It just feels like. You know, and this has been the case for a lot of time or for a lot of different talent over the years. But if diesel's working with a guy like Shawn Michaels or Bret Hart, it's going to be, you know, four stars or better. If diesel's working with Sid, well, temper your expectations. And plus, you know, again, in fairness, everybody involved, it was rushed Yeah, because Vince, Vince changed the direction the day after WrestleMania with, with Sean, that's the infamous, we got a baby face on our hands. So yeah, it, it's, it was rushed. We, we should have not had Sid and diesel until SummerSlam probably, but needed something right away and went right there. And I just think it was too soon. Uh, it, it's pretty big news in June when, um, The WWF pulls off a major coup with NBC. They're going to broadcast a one hour special on June 4th, where they're going to air Lawrence Taylor and Bam Bam Bigelow and Diesel and Sean from the WrestleMania show. Uh, it's apparently a a one shot deal that has, um, supposedly Titan receiving between 200 and $250,000 for the rights. But the idea that the WWF is on NBC for the first time since 91 is a really, really big deal. And it's going to give more exposure to Diesel, Bigelow, and Sean, who are going to be the top draws for the King of the Ring pay-per-view three weeks later. How big of a coup was this to pull off, and how much of it was Vince just making calls to his old pals like Dick Ebersol? Well, it was actually one of those, hey, let's take the temperature, and from NBC side and from our side, as far as trying to get back Saturday night's main event, some more national exposure and the attraction of LT was unique. And again, when you look at WrestleMania, okay, did that do what you wanted it to do? This allowed us to get that match, get that exposure out to an even larger platform by having it on network television. So yeah, it was a huge cue, huge coup. And I think that the payoff to the LT thing was bigger here than it was at WrestleMania. We should mention that that Sid match, not only was it a stinker at in your house, it also hurt diesel. He landed wrong and, uh, hurt his elbow. So he undergoes elbow surgery to remove some bone chips on May 25th in Birmingham with Dr. James Andrews. And it's written that he's probably going to be out of action until King of the ring. Um, when examined by Dr. James Andrews, who at this point had a huge reputation for being the guy who put Bo Jackson back together, it was discovered that he had, uh, both the chips a ruptured sack in the elbow and a clot. So they do the surgery immediately, uh, but now they know Diesel's going to be out of, out of action for a little bit and miss some tapings. Were you concerned at this point that perhaps Diesel was going to be injury prone? I mean, I'm not saying that he had one injury and that's necessarily a big deal, but we've often heard that when Vince gives somebody the big push or he gives them the title, then if, if they start missing opportunities or television, they start to raise their eyebrow, like, 
is this guy reliable or is this guy, Mr. Glass? Was there any concern about that with Kevin Nash here? Not this month. It took a couple months to get that concern. I love you for that. The primetime special, which, uh, we've already explained, obviously gets, uh, a lot of traction in the mainstream and gets people talking and they're also going to continue to build, uh, on raw. So ratings do start to, um, uptick just a little bit like the May 29th raw, which is undertaker and Jeff Jarrett in the main event does a 3.9, uh, which is, uh, really, really good. King of the ring does happen. It's diesel and Bigelow on one side to Tonka and Sid on the other. That goes 17 and a half minutes. It gets a star and a half, not a great match. Uh, this feels like maybe a legit low point for the company. Would you say like summer of 95 is, uh, we're starting to get into, man, it's never been this bad before territory. It sucked. It definitely sucked. And it, and it was, you know, business can be bad sometimes, but you, you can look kind of try to forecast into the future. And if you've got something in the books that you say, okay, man, if we can just get to here, um, there wasn't a whole lot in the book to get to, and you're trying to make chicken salad and you're trying to create on the fly. Um, it was an extremely, extremely challenging time. It's weird though, because it just feels like you do have some hits here. We're talking about some record ratings on raw here, there, but then we're saying, you know, we've got empty arenas for pay-per-views and disappointing buy rates. It's hard to reconcile how that all fits together. That. Fans are willing to watch you on TV. They're just not willing to give you any money. Yeah. It sucks when that happens in your house too. Hey, it works so well. The first time let's do it again. Diesel and Sid this time with a lumberjack match, it gets 10 minutes and two seconds. Meltzer would say this would have been a negative star match. If not for the lumberjacks Sid somehow gets worse every time you see him and diesel didn't look any good either. He's not exactly the caliber of a performer who can carry someone this bad. Um, it gets half a star less than ideal. Were you frustrated with Kevin Nash at this point over the matches and the performances, or are you realizing, man, we set him up to fail. We put him in there with fucking Sid. I mean, when we put him in there with Brett and Sean, he's off to the races, but what can we really expect if he's working with Sid? But again, it's an attraction. I think that most people would have, you know, looked at Sid as this big monster and evenly matched up with Kevin a lot more so than Sean and Brett. I think people looked at Sean and Brett and go, oh, goddamn, the big guy should kill the little guy. In both instances, in at least Sid, there was a formidable opponent on paper. When you're looking at him on the screen, you go, oh my God, this, sh this should be interesting. The reality and, and some of the, uh, the worst matches in history are some of the best drawing matches. This unfortunately wasn't the case in either scenario. And, and listen, you're going to get some criticism for what you just said, but a prime example is Hogan Andre. Yes. It was a huge spectacle and people hold it in high regard because of what a moment it was, but it's not exactly like they were in there putting on a goddamn clinic. But they were, and that that's where, you know, again, the, the skewed, no, they're drawing money for sure. That's what, that's yeah, what it's, the show. I'm it's not a business, it. but you said a moment ago, some of the worst matches were actually the matches that made the most money. Right. Yeah. Let's talk about our solution. You know, we're on the heels of some pretty crummy main events with Sid and and then a combination of Sid and Tatanka. We got to find the right opponent for Diesel. So we've got it figured out for SummerSlam. Underneath, we'll have Shawn Michaels and Sid for the Intercontinental title. But on top, we know who Diesel needs to work with for his world title defense. It's Mabel. Look, we had to protect Mabel from being the third man. <laughs> you're a year away. If we, you're, you're, you're a year away. Man, there were rumblings. Yeah, but still, we were thinking ahead. Listen, this guy's going to leave us we, next year and revolutionize. Be a server. 
There were rumblings, and, and, and Dave Meltzer always having his penis on the pulse. Oh, my God. Uh, he had heard rumblings that, by God, there was going to be this national world uh, origin and that they were looking for Mabel, and we had to get him. We had to protect him. Let's do my story, and I'm sticking to it. Davy Boy is going to turn heel. Um, and, and Melzer would say almost clearly not planned out in advance at the August 12th MSG show. And it's because Davy's going to turn on Lex Luger at the garden. And instead of turning on Luger, he turns on diesel at TV and will be managed by Jim Cornette. And maybe that's because Luger has given notice that he's going to be getting out of here. So we just switch it where he's going to turn a uh, heel on diesel instead. Uh, and we know why we know Luger's going to show up at nitro and well, that's it for him. Uh, let's talk about the Montreal show here on September 15th. Boy, this has been talked about a lot. They're going to do diesel versus, uh, as you call him the pirate. Most likely diesel will get booed out of the building as Pierre is the most popular WWF wrestler in Montreal. He was on a major radio show this past week. And most of the questions were smarter than the garden variety. When asked about Jarrett and Rody leaving, uh, Pierre Carl Ouellette, who wrestles as Jean Pierre Lafitte said that among the wrestlers, it wasn't a big thing. He said, he hopes the fans booed diesel out of the forum and kind of laughed when a caller said it was almost sure to happen. When someone who called in brought up money problems, he said that the crew now is a bunch of young guys and he's not at all worried about the future of the WWF. But this is kind of a big deal that we're going to start promoting this and it is going to get quite a big crowd and there's going to be controversy on the heels of this. So let's talk about it, you know, on paper, why did quote unquote, the pirate seem like the right opponent for Montreal? Is it simply because he was the stronghold there or was Pat Patterson insistent? How does that happen in this era? Montreal's weird place, man. And for whatever reason, we always book Montreal differently than we did any other place in the world. And it performed differently than, than most other markets in the world. I will say this had Jean-Pierre Lafitte stolen diesel's vest brother the place would have been sold out. We could have taken it to the stadium there. Ben Porea in French Canadian. We should mention in late August, uh, a report comes out that the NBC special has now fallen through and now WWF is trying to put together a deal for Fox to air it uh, Friday night in prime time in early September. What happened with the whole NBC thing that felt like a, a done deal just uh, several weeks prior and now maybe not so much. It did, and it's chalk it up to one of those things and chalk it up to just looking at it and people getting cold feet on NBC side saying, ah, you know, do we really want to do this? Do we want to, I think, what, what was it, baseball or some kind of shit, basketball? Um, one of those, two of those other sports that I don't follow. Um, it just, it was cold feet. That's what I'll chalk it up to was cold feet. It is. It has to be disappointing though, because I mean, Vince always maintained a good relationship with those guys. I mean, even doing stuff with them with the XFL. So, and that's years from now, but, uh, either way things worked out with Fox as we well know, let's get to uh SummerSlam. It's, uh, well, not good. Half a star diesel gets the win over Mabel nine minutes and 15 seconds. Meltzer says these two couldn't work a match at all inside the ring. Uh, less than ideal here. Lex Luger does come out and make the save. And, um, Luger's going to be here. Mo is here. There's a lot of interference and other stuff, but there is a, a major spot in the middle of this where, um, Mabel just drops down directly on Kevin's back. And I think in real Boy, life, he did. I think Kevin free fall on that motherfucker. Tell us what you remember about the the spot and Kevin Nash's reaction. Well, 
the spot was scary as shit. Um, Cause it's just all of Mabel's weight. And that was a lot of it just right smack dab. And you could tell, you could tell from Diesel's reaction that he wasn't ready for it. And it was, we, we were thinking, Oh shit, man, he's probably got broken ribs on that or something. And sure enough, man, he came back in a shit pot full of pain and was out for, for quite a while. This was kind of the, the streak of, of Kevin pretty much missing all the house shows, you know, in between pay-per-views during this point, because it was that caliber of matches and, and on the pay-per-views and it just took its toll. It's been said, I think in a shoot interview that. Vince was ready to fire Mabel right after the match and Nash had to talk him out of it. Do you remember that? I know Vince was pissed. We all were pissed. Uh, it just, there was a reputation for Mabel that was, that was good. You know, man, he's, he's getting this push and if he's going to be unsafe, then you, you can't put him in a top spot. And that was the concern and that was the rap. And that's where, you know, everybody was falling that good Lord. I don't know how to, I don't know how to take this to the next level if he can't be safe. So that was, that was where everybody was coming from. I, I don't know that Vince was ready to fire him there at that point, but you know, yeah, it was not happiness. That's for sure. It's a little weird too, the way we're getting here. Uh, Vince McMahon does an interview with Lex Luger where they acknowledge that Diesel had attacked him at SummerSlam, figuring that since Bulldog turned on him, that Luger was a part of it. But they say Luger showed his true colors by running Mo away from the ring. None of that really makes sense. And, uh, well, a lot of stuff doesn't make sense. Like the next pay per view is Diesel and Shawn Michaels defending their singles titles against Yokozuna and Owen Hart defending their tag titles. Huh? Um, it's also important to mention that nitro has now a thing and the first live to, uh, head to head show will be September 25th. When raw is going to be coming from grand rapids, Michigan, it's going to be headlined by diesel versus Davy boy and WCW is going to have obviously their own thing. But I guess if you're going head to head for the first time, you need to have diesel defending the title, right? I would think so. Yes. Probably a pretty good idea. You want him to be featured. The in your and needed to have him in a top spot. The in your house that's coming up is going to be Diesel versus Davy Boy for the WWF title, and this is a six match pay per view. Of course, it's a shorter two hour show. It's got to be time at this point for Diesel to put up a great match on pay per view. Uh, but before we get there, we've got this great show in Montreal. It mount it wound up being a major brouhaha. Because Lafitte, Lafitte refused to do the job. This is according to the observer. For one thing, the crowd was 5,825 fans and around $85,000, which while great by normal WWF standards of these days was a major disappointment because we were hoping for well in excess of 10,000 fans for this match. We've all heard the story about how the, the pirate, as you say, didn't want to take the pin, didn't want to take the jackknife and Sean is behind him sort of riling him up. Shane Douglas has told this story in a bunch of shoot interviews. It's now a legendary story. I don't know that we even have to rehash the whole thing. What do you remember about this and, and the fallout? Well, you know, going back in the, again, yeah, just the feeling in general about Montreal and how to handle Montreal and having to be booked differently and what have you. It, it puts you in a in a situation that what you're doing elsewhere, everywhere else around the globe, you have to you have to change up and you have to do differently in Montreal. And that's kind of what the position that we were put in here. So Carl Willette felt that as <laughs> as pretty much most of the French Canadians do when they're put in that position, they drew the house and that, you know, without them, you wouldn't draw the house. And, and later on, when we kind of got away from 
booking specifically for Montreal found that that wasn't necessarily the case. Does it help to have a local star? Yes, it does. Uh, but at the same time, what were if it works in London, if it works in Paris, if it works in New York, and it works in LA, it's probably going to work in Montreal. So th- this was just you know that that situation, and yeah, everybody everybody was stirring everyone up, and Diesel wasn't happy, and Diesel's looking at it as here I am, I'm the champion, and and. Business isn't that great, but I don't know that this is the right thing to do. Not real happy about going in and not, you know, he's looking at the pirate and I don't see putting this guy over. Um, that was, that's where it got just wonky because It wasn't necessarily, hey, Carl's going to beat you. It was, let's let's come up with a finish in in some way to protect Carl. Um, And then everybody just kind of disturbed the shit and and got it riled up to something more than it needed to be. And I wasn't there. You know, I heard uh, Kevin said, well, let's just go on out there and see what happens. Let, let, me, let me interrupt you right there and tell you what, what Meltzer wrote. He says Lafitte did a ton of local publicity for the match. And when he arrived for the show, he was told by Tony Gurria, it was a jackknife finish. And he immediately refused. Gurria told him or, or tried to talk him into it. Uh, but Lafitte said he thought the finish would not only hurt him, but hurt future crowds in Montreal. And he said he would walk out and not do the match and cost himself the job rather than do the job. Finally, Vince McMahon is called at home. He has a 15 minute conversation with the pirate and they agree to a double count out. Diesel was really mad about this, which was made worse because Shawn Michaels was riling him up saying that he's our champion. He should take the finish. There's always been heat between Michaels and the pirate to begin with. And Michaels isn't well liked in the WWF dressing room. And if people try to defend Michaels pointing out his work rate, the response is usually that Pierre can do anything Shawn can do. And Pierre said he'd do a job for diesel anywhere else except his hometown, but that didn't quell the hostilities. And there's a lot of bitterness that led over into the ring. It is about 60% of the crowd that is pro, uh, diesel, but the other half is firmly behind, you know, their local hometown hero. After the match, Michaels comes out backstage and begins cussing him out. Pierre responds in kind and Pierre gets so riled up. He goes to diesel's dressing room. But no blows took place, and it was definitely the talk of the territory. And the following week, Meltzer would write, The rematch between the two on September 16th in Quebec City saw Lafitte do a leg drop off the top rope and wound up landing with his butt on Diesel's face. Diesel got up immediately and started throwing very hard punches and jackknipes him for the pin. One WWFer told me the scheduled finish was another double countout, but since the night before Lafitte was saying he'd do the job anywhere, but Montreal, I don't know if that was the case, but it was the talk of the dressing room by the end of the week, every problem was cleared up. And that's probably why Lafitte did a clean job on raw the following week. This has become shoot interview lore. And a lot of people say the real catalyst of the issue was Shawn Michaels. Would you agree with that? I, again, I wasn't there and I wouldn't be surprised if it was Shawn Michaels that was stirring it up at the time and just, you know, making a lot more out of it than it was. But I also come from the school of you don't book one town uh, different than the rest of the than the rest of the territory and when we got to that point and, and, and being that big of a company. So I didn't agree with the philosophy of booking Montreal different than any place else. So for me, it was if you didn't in building your new champion and you didn't want to build him, then we shouldn't have booked the match. Well, we booked a great match today when we're talking about Kevin Nash in the WWE. Unfortunately, we're going to have to take a timeout right now. Uh, we, we, we blocked off two hours of Bruce's crazy schedule, but now it's time to get back to making the donuts. Uh, So we're going to have to uh, stop it for now, but we'll pick back up with the next in your house, which will be Diesel and Shawn Michaels taking on Davey Boy and Yokozuna 
when we resume Kevin Nash part two, uh, this is going to be much more in depth than we originally planned. And I love that. Uh, but unfortunately it's going to be a multi-parter. Uh, we appreciate all your support here on the show. Hope you'll stay on track with us. We've got lots of great stuff coming your way. Of course, we're going to keep the Kevin Nash story going, but we've got some other great stuff planned uh, later this month as well, including, and I'm really excited about this one because I like talking about the old school stuff. We're going to break down in your house two in long form. We'll get a little more modern with great American bash 2005. And we'll wrap up the month of July with Saturday night's main event from July 28th, 1990. But at least for now, Bruce, thank you for blocking off two hours of time for us today. This is two long shows in a row, man. I appreciate your commitment to getting up at the butt crack of dawn and uh, trying to talk a little old wrestling with us. Uh, you know, no worries. And, and Conrad will even do this, this two parter. You're not going to have to wait till next Friday and we'll, we'll get it done this weekend and have it out there for everybody. How's that? I like it. We're going to try to circle up sometime Sunday or, or perhaps first of the week. And we'll be back at you with Kevin Nash part two. This is fun, man. We'll see you soon right here on another something to wrestle with Bruce Pritchard. Rock on. All right, Bruce, let's talk about something that you and I have uh, talked about for a while here on the show. Hair loss. Now I've shared with you that earlier this year, I turned 40 right before that took my parents to the beach for their anniversary. And as I saw my 63 year old dad getting into the pool, I noticed he was, uh, I think Tony Schiavone described Arn Anderson's as a flesh colored yarmulke. And I was a little nervous, Bruce. Hey man. I knew my dad was gray, but he can't be losing his hair too. That's not good for me. And then I remembered Bruce, there's only two FDA approved medications that prevent hair loss. And I knew that because our friends at keeps offer both keeps has a simple stress-free way for you to keep your hair. I started doing it in April. You should too. You've got convenient virtual doctor consultations and medications delivered straight to your door every three months, meaning you don't even have to leave your home. It's also low cost, Bruce. Treatments start at just $10 a month and Keeps offers generic versions. They've got discreet packaging and proven results. Keeps has more five-star reviews than any of their competitors, Bruce. But, but I at, hate having to go to a doctor to get that stuff, man. Now it's showing up at your house. Come on. Doesn't get any better than that. And here's the thing I want to remind everybody. Don't wait until it's too late. Prevention is key. Treatments can take four to six months to see results. So act fast. If you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to K E E P S.com slash wrestle to receive your first month of treatment for free. That's keeps.com slash wrestle to get your first month for free. That's K E E P S.com slash wrestle keeps.com slash wrestle. It is truly wild to think about how quickly diesel made a name for himself in WWE. Obviously he had the look. He was paired with the right guys, and you knew that he was destined to break out. And I'll tell you what, I know what else is going to break out. That's going to be the Click This podcast that is joining the ad-free shows family. Episode 1 launches July 11th at 6 a.m. Eastern. Kevin Nash, Sean Oliver are going to take you through the highs and lows of the career of Big Sexy himself. Uh, Kevin Nash is going to be a tremendous addition to the ad-free shows family, and we are very much looking forward to adding him to the team. And if you want to hear more about Kevin Nash's forays outside of WWE and to maybe say WCW, well, I actually had a chance to just host 83 weeks with Eric Bischoff, and we talked about Kevin Nash's 1999, and that, of course, is the year where he was Booker. This is a little bit controversial. Eric and I went at it a couple of times, but I thought it was a really fun look back at one of the most tumultuous periods in WCW history. So go check that out over on the 83 Weeks feed with Eric Bischoff. But as we reached In Your House 3, we knew that there was greatness in the future for Kevin Nash. He's going to become a world champion. He's going to make a move, but not before making a further impact in Titan Towers. And with that, we tee up episode 273 of Something to Wrestle. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Something to Wrestle with Bruce Pritchard, a very special Sunday edition. Bruce, what's going on, man? How are you? Bah humbug. Hey, it's not Christmas. That's right. You know what? I'm carrying it over, man. I'm carrying it over. What? Anger, mood, attitude. I got it all today. 
All How right. the fuck are you? Man, better than I deserve. It's uh, probably yeah, not. That's right. It's probably not the Memorial Day weekend we had planned, though. Yeah, well, as you can see outside my windows, it's pouring rain. Yeah. Pitch black. Yeah. Yeah. Not exactly going according middle to Middle of the day. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, there you go. Happy fucking Memorial Day. <laughs> actually, Memorial Day is one of my favorite holidays because we, it's when we remember those people that actually served and made this country that we live in free for us and our children. So to all of you brave men and women that made that happen from the deepest of my heart, thank you very much. I wish that I could celebrate the day, um, but it's not about us celebrating. It's about what they did for us in the past to make this future of ours free. Hey, let me ask you, what was your time in the combine? My time in the combine, uh, 4.1. I was going to say that, that uh, that's one of the fastest back pedals I've ever heard. I mean, really great job on that. You were very nimble, very quick. I think you're going to do well. That's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're let, shirtless today. I just noticed that. Yeah. We've been talking for like 45 minutes and you haven't noticed. You ain't got no clothes on, do you? Yeah. It was, uh, it was, it was quite the evening here at the Connor Addison last night. I'm in my, I got my little slippers on, got my little shorts, got my Beatles hoodie on. I can even put the hood up like this. Watch this. Boom. Boom. I can put the hood on, but uh, there you go. That's yeah. my invitation. If I had a towel, I'd be somebody else. But right no, now I'm just, no, no, no. Um, here's the know. deal. Put, hold, hold your, your pointer up like that. Okay, I want you to say BP phone home. <laughs> BP phone home. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we've got Bruce in a good mood this morning, despite what he says. Uh, I'm excited about this one, man. You and I have uh, been looking forward to finishing our Kevin Nash episode for a while. Are you been looking forward to it. I love talking about Kevin Nash. One of the most I interesting. Like, I like Kevin Nash. I, I fucking find Kevin to be extremely charming. I, it's one of those things. Kevin can be one of the most negative, ornery motherfuckers in the world. But goddamn, is he fun to talk to? He is a very entertaining son of a bitch. And uh, the real life Kevin Nash. Uh, he is super entertaining. And we're glad to be trying to entertain you today as we cover part two of him. Emphasis on trying, folks, because there are three kinds of people in this world those that give their best shot. Wait, those that try. Goddamn, I almost fucked up my own shit. Those that try, those that give their best shot, and those that do whatever it takes. So we're going to do whatever it takes today, Connie. Oh, wow. Because, Even see, while there are three kinds of people, there's only one four time oh. by Hall of Famer. Did we even discuss this? Very briefly, was, but if you so, want to go ahead, do, do you want to tell everybody what the check number was when you wrote ain't no that? Check, man. Ain't no check. No, you don't buy, you can't buy this shit. You earn this shit. This isn't the kind of karate that you go down to your local fucking, uh, goddamn strip mall and write a check for your black belt. No, I earned my black belt. I earned my black belt hall of fame. First person ever to go in the black belt hall of fame. That wasn't a black belt. Went in as a brown belt. And first person ever to get four. You're the only belt. four time. So in the and, only four time black belt hall of famer, Chuck Norris is not, but Bruce Pritchard is nope. Steven Seagal's not, but Bruce Pritchard Steven is Seagal's not even a fucking goddamn black belt. God, if I Steven Seagal, I whip his ass right now. Where is he? I don't see him. You know what? Cause he's afraid to get in his whoop ass. <laughs> Well, let's get Steven going. Seagal. Fuck him and his Aikido bullshit. Where are you at on John Van Damme? Actually, now? I love Aikido. I was very good at Aikido. But fuck, Seagal's an asshole. Fucking uh, Judo Gene LaBelle's whipped his ass so many times. Judo Gene LaBelle at 119 will be able to fucking kick Steven Seagal on Steven Seagal's best day ever in his life. I didn't know you were. you had such strong feelings about Steven Seagal. He's a little, I'm not a fan of Steven Seagal at all. Arrogant, uh, just not, no. Where are you at on uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme? Um, nice guy. Super nice guy, man. Uh, I don't know that much about Van Damme other than he's a pretty nice guy. Uh, misunderstood. You know, he we went through some drug shit and people, he got the big head for a little while. 
But it, it happens in that world. Seagal, though, it, it's, I don't think that, that Van Dam Van Dam was a very good martial artist and, and pretty good. But he was a good-looking guy that rode that fame. Seagal, just not a good person. Just not mm. a nice person in general. And But you are, right? Are you are you debating that? No, I was just sharing with the audience. That, like, oh, but you are like like I'm not. I was just telling the audience oh, that you. What you were doing. See, I can see your beady little fucking eyes looking at me like, oh, so, so, but you are. <laughs> yeah, that's what this whole show is going to be, motherfucker. So buckle up. <laughs> Let's get into it. Uh, we return to the diesel story with, uh, Kevin Nash being the WWF world heavyweight champion. And he's about to team up with Shawn Michaels as two dudes with attitude. Uh, before we get started, the WWE network on Peacock or whatever it's called now, just did a feature on these two that you were heavily involved in. Do you enjoy doing these, uh, behind the scenes documentaries for the network? Cause you're great nope. on them. You hate it. You don't like it. I don't like it. Why not? Well, um, I, I'm okay, but gosh, Bruce, you do a podcast and you talk about all this shit. Did you notice most of the stuff that we talk about has all been talked about before by someone else. And I was just trying and put a truthful spin on it from a different vantage point, not from a hearsay vantage point, not from a, uh, some little bitch in California typing on his little typewriter that he doesn't even know what week it is because his office is such a shambles, um, spin on it. I, I, so I don't know. Um, I think they're, they're beautiful pieces of work when they come out. They're, they're pretty good, but it's, it's little shit. Like, uh, my hair looked like shit in the Shawn Michaels A and E deal. And that was their fault. That wasn't your fault. Yeah, it was their fault. And okay. here's why. Because when we do our shit, most of the time we have hair and makeup there. They don't. Well, so yeah, it was my fault. I didn't brush my hair out before I fucking did it. So yeah. Well, fuck them for letting you look like you look, you know, why, right. would, they, why would they do that? No, oh, man, man. It was like, it was parts of it were like sticking up and shit. It was, it was horrible. You need to talk to somebody about that. How dare they let you look like you look. Thank you. Uh, nonsense. I'm a damn good looking man. You ain't got to put up with that kind of shit. Yeah. I ain't got to put up with that kind of shit. So let's talk about in your house. Number three, this one went down September 24th, 1995 in your favorite Saginaw, Michigan. You were telling me the other day, how much you love Saginaw. Anyway, diesel and Sean I love Saginaw. I see Amway capital, right? I don't know. I never been. Tell me all about it. Regale me with your stories of Saginaw. Well, I, I, I'm probably going to get corrected by someone, uh, but I think Saginaw, Michigan is the Amway headquarters. Are you familiar with Amway? Uh, yeah. My grandfather was in Amway. Yeah. Did you ever get pitched to Amway pitch man about McDonald's and they show you about flipping burgers and all this stuff and no. how you can duplicate things and, and how the main guy that did McDonald's, uh, this used to be their pitch until the founder came out, but about how the <laughs> guy at McDonald's about all the money that he made because he had so many people and he was able to replicate that system all over the world. No, I didn't. Well, that same thing can happen with Amway. Really? Yeah. Sounds like you've got some exciting information to share with us, Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, yeah, no, we, I just don't have the cookies and uh, Jack and Coke to be able to get you to sign up. And is it true that we could make a bunch of money even in, in, on a part-time basis, Bruce? Oh, on a part-time basis, actually on a no time basis, because you would have so many people working for you. <laughs> no time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. You've got people working for you all over and guess what? Guess what? You don't even have to worry about payroll. Uh-uh. You know why? Because those people working for you, they pay you. Isn't that great? You're working. You've got a job. You've got a company. You are the boss. And everyone working for you pays you. Want to hear a kicker? I'm ready. I love this one. All the people that work for them. They pay you in perpetuity. You know what that means? Forever. Go ahead and ask me what happens to the people that work for the people that work for the people that work for you. What happens to them? <sighs> they get rolling. They pay you. Oh, 
all the way down the line. So it's kind of almost like you're sitting at the top of a pyramid. Everything Everything below you feeds back up to the top. You know, one day, it's a, it's, it's a great scam. I mean, um, one day, Bruce, we should blow this popsicle stand out here, you know, telling stories on podcasts and you writing about pretend fights. What if we just said, forget all that. And we, we started doing a pyramid scheme, made some real money. What about God, that? Yeah, I, dude, I've got that down. I know. I mean, you just sold me. It's awesome. I don't have to do Cause payroll because they're paying the me. I love it. We will sit at the top and you know what? We'll do a damn podcast about doing that, about what we used to do. <laughs> what would we call it? Bruce Pritchard's podcast. Oh yeah. I just has money dripping on it. What do you think about With it? Conrad. <laughs> <laughs> I finally got my name on the show. I'm so excited. <laughs> Uh, so it's diesel and Shawn Michaels in the main event, taking on Davey boy and Yokozuna. They're going to go 15 minutes and 42 seconds. So the story here is, uh, Owen Hart isn't going to show up to the pay-per-view. So because he's injured and can't compete, uh, Davey boy has a replacement. Um, gorilla monsoon is going to order Jim Cornette to either send Yoko in alone or pick a new partner. And of course, uh, we know what's coming. The dudes with attitudes get the win, but Owen does miraculously show up, but it doesn't matter. He's power bombed by diesel. The pen is counted three stars. So now Shawn Michaels is the intercontinental champion and a tag champ. Diesel is the world champ and a tag champ. Of course we overturn it the next night because Owen wasn't the legal man. He had technically been replaced in the match. what did you think of this creative and this brief moment where uh, the two dudes with attitudes had all the gold. Yeah, I thought it was stupid and it sucked. Why didn't you like it? I didn't. Well, why the fuck? It's it's an old Gary Hart finish. Where in the middle of a match, <laughs> sometimes Gary would roll in the ring. Yeah. And the guy would pin Gary and they'd ring the bell. So the baby face went over without his guy getting beat. Right. That's what it was. It was the shits. And you hate it. I did hate it. You just think it's a cheap way out. I did not like it at all. Who's who's creative would that have been? Do you think uh, it might've been bill Watts's or something? I don't know. So let's talk about the observer. Uh, just as the cameras faded to black signifying the end of the in your house pay-per-view show in Winnipeg, a disgusted Vince McMahon threw down his glasses and his headset and said the words horrible. As he started to walk to the back with Jim Ross while a pull apart brawl with Bret Hart and diesel was still going on in the ring. Seconds later, as the brawl ended, Diesel, the person McMahon had planned to build his company around just one year earlier, was being booed out of the building. Yet another in a long line of failed experiments in the quest to find a new Hulk Hogan. So Meltzer would continue that it's pretty much unanimous that the crowd is is not happy with Diesel in the main event here. And he's saying that this probably means Bret Hart is going to be used like Ric Flair and they just slide him in whenever the next failed experiment fizzles. What do you remember about Vince at the end of this show, being upset, taking off the headset and the glasses saying horrible, stomping around to the back, any of that ring a bell. So, so Meltzer was backstage and witnesses and was reporting on him. Cause that's what he does. He's a reporter, right? So I guess I'm not asking you to debate what was written in the observer. Well, I'm, I'm asking where the information came from so that I can verify that information. I'm asking, did it happen or not? I don't know. I don't remember. Do you remember? Was it significant enough to me that, that I would have remembered that. Um, so that's why I, I I'm curious as to where he would have gotten that information from. Uh, he must've been right there, you know, because he's so smart and has all this inside information. Was Vince upset? I honestly don't remember. I know I was. Why were you upset? I didn't like it. I didn't, I didn't think that it did anybody any favors. Why and not? I felt it was a Gary Hart, you know, Gary Hart was great as a booker, but Gary sometimes would, would put himself in positions where he, that he had no way out sometimes with the talent with which he was involved and would do that bullshit finish. And that's exactly what this was, was a bullshit finish. So you're upset with the finish and, and, and you're suggesting that perhaps Vince was upset with the finish. He's not necessarily upset with, with, uh, diesel. 
he may have been upset with Diesel. I, I think that overall, this was kind of one of those times where you're you're looking at things and your desired response is not is not coming um, for whatever reason. And it's you have a live fucking audience every single night that can give you feedback instantly. And if it's not the feedback that you're looking for, most of the times you can go look in the mirror and go, Oh, okay. Well shit, man, that sucked. Take me through uh, back to that night. Is this where you could pinpoint sort of the bloom is off the rose with Vince McMahon and diesel in terms of Vince realizes, you know, this isn't working. I've got to make a change. I don't think you can pinpoint any one night. I think it's an accumulation of, of more than one night. It's a feeling. It's a trend. It, it's when those boos and, or that lack of enthusiasm from the audience over time that you go, okay, well shit, this isn't working. You, you can't just go off of one night's response. This may have been the one that put it over the edge. I don't know. So uh, we know it's coming though. We're going to book a survivor series match between, um, Brett and diesel. But first we're going to talk about the next in your house pay-per-view where he's taking on Davy boy. And this is not another great match. Meltzer would write diesel retained the WWF title beating Davy boy in 1814. Virtually the entire match was Smith working on diesel's left knee. Smith ended up posting, posting diesel outside the ring and slapped Hart at ringside Hart jumped into the ring and went wild on Smith for a DQ on diesel for outside interference. Diesel then attacked Hart for costing him the match to build up their singles match on November 19th and the show went off the air with the pull apart, pull apart brawl. So one star, another bad matchup, not great. Tell me about the progression of the diesel character here and what you guys are thinking creatively at the time. Well, I don't think it was necessarily working and it goes back to day one of, okay, here's, here's diesel and he's your champion. We want him to be this big baby face. So he's going to lead everybody in prayer. And then, uh, <laughs> let's sing, you know, hi, ho, ho, ho green. No. Um, so song. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you. Yeah. And, and he ceased being diesel and became, well, it's Kevin Nash. Diesel is Kevin Nash. He was at the East Tennessee playing basketball. And oh, what a, what a quarter he had one time where he scored four points. And uh, it's all of a sudden, uh, everything I loved about Diesel went away because he became Kevin Nash from East Tennessee uh, University and a basketball player that got hurt. Uh, everything that was cool about him went away because somebody felt, God damn, we got to have credentials. You got to have credentials. You got you to tell a real story about these times. He, he could have been, he could have been two and a half time all American. Nobody gives a fuck about that shit. They thought diesel was cool. He kicked people's asses. When he stopped being, ceased to become diesel. What the fuck, you know, the, the, that, and then when you, you, you figure that out midterm, it's kind of like, ah, eh. the audience overall was enthralled and they were intrigued by diesel. They weren't intrigued by Kevin Nash in this point in time. Do you remember having a discussion with Vince about that, that perhaps you had, you guys had gone too far to sort of blur the lines of Kevin Nash and diesel? Oh God, no, I remember how I remember <laughs> begging almost not to do that goddamn sit down interview that they did way back when with, well, Kim, t- tell me, tell me about your college career. Tell me what, what t- tell me, tell me about Kevin. We killed him right there in that, in that, in that moment, we killed what we had spent all that time building. Are you trying to just be entertaining or was it really Jim Ross? No, that's, that's the 100% truth. Hang on. I didn't even finish what I was saying. Uh, I, I'm, I'm always entertaining, but that's still the truth. My point is the primary driving force in that creative, in your opinion, was Jim Ross. He was pushing for it on the other side, pretty hard. Pushing that, that in order to have a champion, people would believe in that you had to give them real things to believe in. 
And you had to tell the real story, but yet not one time would you sit there and fucking take Hulk Hogan. Uh, t- now tell me, Terry, yeah, yeah, when you were in the band and you know, you, you paid, played bass, right? The fuck would ever bring that up and why? Right. Why do you want to? This is, you know, Diesel was a character. Kevin Nash was a person. Yes. The audience was in love with the character. Right. They didn't know the person. You keep the person mysterious and a mystique. When he becomes just like your buddy that went to college at East Tennessee and played a year on the team, what's special about him anymore? Yeah. He's like I everybody can, else. I can relate to him. You you don't want people to relate to your top mega stars. Yeah. Whew. You're pretty fired but up. But I do you disagree. No, I think you're on the money. I'm not disagreeing with that, but I think your point has also been, and boy, me and you sound like assholes when we say this, but if you're going to brag about a guy's amateur career, he needs to have been a badass amateur. The idea being, you know, it's one thing if you bring in Kurt angle and you, you know, parade him around as the Olympic gold medalist, but while Kevin Nash played division one ball for the Tennessee volunteers, not East Tennessee. It's not as if, you know, he got drafted in the league and blah, blah, blah. So he didn't, while he was obviously a much better athlete than you and I would ever be, it's not like he became Michael Jordan, I think is your point, right? That is my point. And and I'm not taking anything away from his college career. Of course not. At all. All right. This is the straight up truth here. I have 13 weddings this year. That is not just a lot of money spent, but also... A lot of open bars, and despite all the champagne and the booze that I'll probably be drinking, I've actually been looking forward to brunch the next day because I'll have my Z-Biotics with me. You see, Z-Biotics pre-alcohol probiotic is the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. It was invented by PhD scientists to tackle rough mornings after drinking. And here's how it works. When you drink, alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in the gut. It's this byproduct, not dehydration, that's to blame for your rough next day. Zbiotics produces an enzyme to break this byproduct down. It's designed to work like your liver, but in your gut. And that's where you need it most. Just remember to drink Zbiotics before drinking alcohol. Drink responsibly and get a good night's sleep to feel your absolute best tomorrow. I'm telling you, I've got these weddings. I've got chronic acid reflux. You would never know that I'm under 30 years old, but Zbiotics was there when I needed it. After any time I drink heavily at one of these weddings, it's okay. It's our time to wind down just a little bit. As instructed, I drank a bottle of Z-Biotics before any alcohol, and I was amazed at how good I felt the next day. I didn't feel worn down. I didn't feel nauseous. I felt perfect, and I want you to feel perfect, too. Give Z-Biotics a try for yourself. Go to zbiotics.com forward slash wrestle to get 15% off your first order when you use wrestle at checkout. Zbiotics is backed with 100% money back guarantee. So if you're unsatisfied for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Remember to head to zbiotics.com slash wrestle and use the code wrestle at checkout for 15% off. And thank you, Zbiotics, for being our sponsor. It was basketball. Yeah. If if Kevin were now on the Cleveland Cavaliers That's and different. he was playing basketball, goddamn, I'm gonna talk all about that shit. Yes. But now he's diesel. Diesel didn't go to fucking Tennessee. And and Diesel has now excelled in the World Wrestling Federation more than Kevin Nash excelled at basketball, is your point. One hundred percent. There you go. Okay. So Davey boy, why was the match just a miss? I know that diesel has had great matches with guys like Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels, you know, in the MMA community, they say styles make fights. Is this just a styles clash with Davey boy and diesel? Because Davey boy is not really the fly around and bump for you guy. 100% Davey boy is a powerhouse guy. Davey boy is one that has to be the, the powerhouse in the match. And you're not going to do that with a big seven foot fucking bastard like Kevin Nash. So uh, if you, I'm not saying this to be funny, but if you know that, and we know that, why does it get booked? People think it's an attraction that they'll open their wallets for, and they don't really think about whether or not it's any good. 
Well, sometimes, you know, the greatest matches in your head that you think that are attractive matches on paper don't always work out in the ring. And that's what happened here. You, 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 I think we can trick ourselves into believing that, by God, you know, they're, they're two, they're two guys that are competent that can go out and they can make up for the shortcomings. They can make up for the differences in styles and make this thing work. Didn't happen. You know, you don't hit home runs every single time you're at bat. No doubt. Well, let's, uh, baseball analogy and I hate baseball. Let's talk about the big meeting in Cincinnati. This was in the observer from November 13th, 1995. Vince McMahon had a surprise meeting with the wrestlers at the November 3rd house show in Cincinnati. Don't have much in the way of details, but it apparently was to combat the poor morale of late with the cutting out of the money losing B shows. A lot of paranoia has started and some of it is justified with half as many shows. The mid card guys for the most part are going to work a lot less dates and make a lot less money. And the underneath guys will, for the most part, have it even worse. Even the top of the card guys are concerned since they'll be on the same show. The feeling is the money will be cut up in a manner where it's split more with top guys. So even the top guys will be earning less. The idea is that if in the past you had undertaker and razor on one B show and you had Sean Brett and diesel on the a show, then none of them is ever more than three from the top. Now, one of those guys is going to be five from the top, which is a lower spot when it comes to making money. The guys were also upset about several shows that have either been canceled or should have been canceled, which would leave them on the road away from home in the middle of a tour for a day, making no money in the WWF wrestlers only get paid when they work a show. So if a mid card guy is cut from 20 dates down to six or eight, his income will go down 60 or 70%. Some guys are being cut down in dates even worse. And they are guys who go on a month without bookings at all, and therefore have no income. However, the company can't go on running shows that lose money for the company. So wrestlers can have work. So it's a complicated issue. 95 has always been fascinating to discuss because business is down. And I think there's always something to learn when you rebound. And we know the story, the WWF is going to rebound very strong. But it feels like we're knee deep in cost cutting mode here. What do you remember about this time and specifically this meeting in Cincinnati? It's a rare appearance for Vince on a house show. Well, business was a shit. Business was, was kind of in the toilet and we were in a place where you're looking at your business and so much of it is, you know, in the red and it's, it's not good. So one of the loss, you know, the, the biggest losses is when you're looking at B shows and or C shows that are a drain and everything that you may have made on one show is completely eaten up and taken away by the other shows. Um, or you just have two average shows that would maybe have just been one good, decent a show for lack of a better example, but it, it was a period where do we want to continue w- running all of these markets and running as many shows as we are, or should we just run shows where we're going to make money? And the decision, you know, comes down to, all right, we're going to run one show. Now, would it have been better maybe to cut all those people loose? Maybe it should, maybe we should have, right. Maybe we should have, well, there was hope that we would turn it around and, um, that's just kind of where we were at the time. And it was a meeting to go out and address it with all of the talent and face them before it got to TV. TV is a horrible, a horrible time and a horrible place to try and discuss things like this because you're trying to get your, your television produced. And schedules, it's a yeah. terrible time to do business. So. He makes this appearance and is this the story or is that, was that another town where supposedly he's on the phone with the quote unquote click and decides to come in? No, this, this was to come down and address everybody while they were all at a live event. 
how do you, uh, what do you remember of the meeting? How was it received? Did you feel like, okay, everybody's at least got a clear vision. It's not like he's down here spreading joy and happiness. He's trying to just manage expectations, right? Yeah. I think people are kind of like just now looking, <laughs> you know, now looking at their bank accounts going, okay, what the fuck? Um, I'm going to have less opportunity to learn. I hope I'm on the events. Let's talk about the, uh, the observer again here, because it feels like We've got a bit of a situation. The status of the intercontinental title apparently changed regularly over the past weekend. Razor Ramon faced Sid and what was announced live as a non-title match with one, two, three kid as a referee on the October 23rd taping and the match that aired on November 13th with Sid winning due to kid helping him and completing his heel turn was billed as a title match on all television leading up to the match. The plan was for Sid to come out of the match with the title. A plan that was changed after superstars action zone and mania were taped midweek. The cover story announcement was made early in the raw show of it being a non-title match with the explanation given that gorilla monsoon had considered what happened at the house shows over the weekend and Nassau Coliseum Worcester and the Meadowlands and smelled a rat. The word amongst the wrestlers is that Sid who left the tour because of a family emergency was pretty upset after being promised the title and having it pulled from him. And that Hunter Hearst Helmsley will eventually be getting the title from Ramon. This has caused major morale problems because people see it was the click controlling the championships again. And people believe that different rules apply to them compared to the other wrestlers. Of course, the fact is the leadership of the click is scheduled to be losing to the WWF or the WWF title to Bret Hart this coming weekend. So there aren't any signs that that decision is going to be reversed at the last minute. So tell me about how this changed and why it changed to the best of your recollection that Sid was going to be the intercontinental champ. And now he's not, I don't really remember other than I believe Sid went home. Sid went home upset and it was a softball season. Oh, I don't know. I don't think November yeah. is softball season. It may be in, uh, Tennessee and Arkansas. Yeah. So you just, you, you view that as just Sid being said, no reason to be this way difficult. No, but it's, it's, it's easy for people to make shit up and create stories that, that aren't necessarily there, but I mean, a lot of time on your hand or your hands, or you're not even there. It's easy to create shit. Well, and also too, you know, paranoia and wrestling is a thing. It's not just for newsletters. It's for guys, right? All the above. And then they call newsletter guys and spin their own stories. So let's talk about the 95 survivor series. This is the big match that uh, I think everybody should go out of their way to see if they want to watch one diesel match from this era. It's Bret Hart pinning diesel in 24 minutes and 54 seconds to win the title. There's a big spot here where Bret goes flying off of the apron through a table. That's of course the Spanish announce table. It was tremendous. And, uh, he, he sets up a jackknife. He being diesel pronouns, pal and Bret small packages him and pins diesel and then diesel sits up furious and mouths the word motherfucker and it's pretty cool three and a half stars great match love the finish the 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 silly table spot that has been overdone to death was brand new back then for the wbf i love this what'd you think i thought it was excellent i, I thought that the the match itself was probably one of the best matches that uh, diesel had ever had and it told a great story it was a very simple finish, um, that worked. It was believable. Anybody can get caught in a small package. Of course, afterwards, diesel just goes nuts. He jackknifes, uh, Brett twice after the match, he's attacking several referees. He's being booed by a large majority of the fans and Jr. and, and Jim or Jr. and Vince easy for me to say are playing it up as if this is a full blown heel turn was this way overdue at this point. Do you think, or was this the right time to turn diesel full blown heel? No, I thought I completely thought it was the right time to turn him because he had reached the point where the audience didn't see him as the champion and kind of saw him as the guy that was, you know, envisioned as the champion. They weren't, weren't accepting it. Didn't want it. Weren't going to buy it. Um, however, him being a disgruntled, pissed off guy about that did work. 
And and that that played a lot into, you know, who Kevin was at the time. And Kevin wasn't necessarily all that happy at the time. So now let's get that and put that on camera and put it on the air. Let's um let's talk about Diesel here. In this era, he starts to change a little bit. You know, we just mentioned when he gets pinned here, he sits up, you know, says motherfucker. You can read it plain as day on his lips. Uh, and then, you know, a, a little later, not too much longer after this, we're going to see him start flipping the bird. What do you remember about, I mean, this meeting, was there more to it than just, Hey guys, hang in there. Is this sort of a. Hey, let's try to get a little more adult and a little less childish because it does feel like at least with diesel, we're turning the page here and we're going to go more adult. Yeah. I mean, it was a conscious effort definitely. And it was an effort to, for our pay-per-view events in particular, to make them a little edgier and you could definitely get away with more on them because you're not on USA cable and there's not someone that is going to censor you and say, ah, hey, wait a minute. No, you can't do that on pay-per-view. You pretty much had fair reign. It, not necessarily something you want to do all the time because of your audience, but it was enough to break character and get a little bit of a peek and, oh my God, was he supposed to do that? Because it wasn't all done. Now it's all been done so much that it's just, eh, it's a spot. The, uh, the big title change here is not the focus very long. It almost fades into the background the very next day. Of course, this is when we're going to do the whole Shawn Michaels collapse EMT skit. Do you think in hindsight, we were just ready to move on from diesel or was it just timing of, Hey, we got this idea with Sean and it's time to do something there because it doesn't feel like 24 hours later, diesel's in nearly the same spot. Well, I think it may not have felt that 24 hours later, but Diesel was still going to be in a top spot and be involved in everything. You know, sometimes things take time. It doesn't, you don't have to have every answer to every question 24 hours later after a pay-per-view. Sometimes you want to leave the audience asking questions and wonder where the fuck are they going now? Well, I'm, I guess what I'm driving at is it feels like, you know, Diesel loses the title and immediately the big story is Shawn Michaels. So it feels like, okay, Sean and Brett are going to be on a collision course here. Was it time in Vince's mind? Had we seen enough of diesel going on last? Obviously he can still be a big contributor. He's going to be a big player for us, but at least for now, the audience isn't digging this the way we hoped. So we're going to pivot to Sean. It, it was a time to freshen up the story and change the story up a little bit. You'd had an awful lot of diesel on top. So maybe that character needed to rest and maybe it was time to just you change it up a little bit. Uh, Meltzer would say besides the angle, the other highlights were diesel taking on a new badass baby face image, blaming Vince McMahon on an interview for creating a fake image for him the past year. And again, and attempting to appeal to the 26 to 34 year old male audience as a kick-ass, no apologies, baby face. Are you happy with this transition? You know, I mean, it feels like. I, I would assume when you're, when you're saying motherfucker and you're flipping birds that in this era, that's heel stuff, you know, sort of pre Steve Austin, making it all cool, but the kick-ass, no apologies, baby face. Is that the right term for diesel here? No, I, I really believe that we were looking more for, um, a heel character, but I think that the more heel character we went, the cooler he would become. The house shows over the weekend did uh, 95,000 in Philadelphia and 163,000 at Madison Square Garden. That's way, way down from well, what Well, you... I had a friend that was there, so they only did like uh, 22. 4,300 fans in Philly, 7,400 fans in Manhattan. This feels like a bad thing. I mean, this is Thanksgiving weekend. Normally, those shows do much better. And for whatever reason, Fans are not turning up for it. And Meltzer would say people didn't know that Brett had won the title in time or, or, or that he would be taking on the undertaker in the main event. So perhaps you guys were just sort of marketing what you had been marketing and fans just weren't that into it. it I feel bad for diesel because it feels like he's done everything that's been asked of him, but he's not connecting with the audience and, and you're blaming really the creative and the way he was presented as the reason 
it's not like Kevin personally could have done anything differently. Could he? Um, you don't know. I, I don't know that he could. It, and it was creative and it was frankly, Kevin, you know, trying to, to pull off the creative and trying to be goofy, you know, crazy Kevin. Some of that was him, but a lot of that was a creative decision and that, you know, we want you to be more real. We want, you know, we want, uh, Kevin Nash, you know, from, uh, it's just, no, this, I don't think that the, I, this is one of my examples I will always give of a talent really being over with the audience. And so they get over with the audience, you make the change, but then you change the talent. The audience doesn't, they loved, they loved and or hated the character you were presenting. Now, if the character you were presenting at the time wasn't working, maybe you need to change the character. The difference was, was the reason that we made the change with Diesel is because Diesel was getting over with the audience. So let's move that character into a different position uh, in the stories and make him the focal point. As soon as you do that and you in the middle of the character and it's no longer uh, red riding hood, it's now it's Meryl Streep or whoever who went to acting school at Tennessee university or whatever the fuck I wanted to hear about little red riding hood here. I've got diesel. Who's a kick-ass guy and fucking doing all this cool shit. Ah, he's just a normal guy. He's just a guy who played basketball in in college. Let's talk about uh, the Observer. The WWF received complaints regarding Bret Hart and Diesel using chairs and Diesel mouthing motherfucker at the Survivor Series. They're trying to do a balancing act between making it a rougher product but not alienating any of the audience or the sponsors. That isn't going to be easy. I know it's silly, but we've talked about it so much. Tell me about diesel mouthing the word motherfucker. Was that something that is discussed ahead of time? Hey, show real emotion. Or, I mean, it's not, I I just have a hard time believing that Vince sits him down and says, now, Kevin, if you could look right at the camera and say, motherfucker, that'd be great. I don't recall that being something he was told, but I'm sure he was told to make it real and that made it real. And here's the other interesting thing when, when I, when I read things about Well, oh, my God, there were complaints. Do you know what complaints means? More than one. Yeah. Doesn't mean 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. More than one. So if two people complained out of the whole thing, now you got to take into consideration apparently in 1990 or especially in 1995. For someone to sit down and write a letter or make a phone call, that takes a lot of effort. Most people don't do that. However, to get one or two complaints to a cable company, to them when they aren't getting complaints on anything else, oh, my God, we got all these complaints. They had to field a call or two. And when you do that deep dive, because I have done that deep dive of give me a sampling of your complaints, give me a sampling of the complaints of all these gross, you know, complaints. And during email times where you, you will receive maybe four or five complaints. And and when you dig even a little bit deeper and you realize they all come from the exact same city and or area and they're all worded almost identically the same and the time frame that they are sent is in the middle of the night at the same you know within a five hour span of time or things like that that sometimes you gotta wonder okay is this a couple of fans in uh hoboken or huntsville They got mad at it and say, I'm going to write. I am too. Let's do it right now. So you receive complaints because you put an S on it. It's more than one. I don't know. I I really don't know. Um, It may have been someone in in the cable company that watched it and wasn't crazy about it. 
Um, so it was an attempt to make it more real, and that's that's what it is. Let's talk about the next in your house. This time, instead of working on top, he is the fourth match on the show, including the free for all undertaker and Brett still have singles matches after him. And he doesn't even beat Owen Hart. Owen wins by DQ because diesel shoves the ref after using the jackknife. And after the match, he used another jackknife. Of course, Meltzer is a big Owen Hart fan. So he says, Owen did a great job of carrying this, but it was only four thirty-four. gave it a star and a half, but it feels like we're just sort of treading water a little bit here. Uh, let's get to the Royal rumble. Shawn Michaels wins 58 minutes, 49 seconds. He super kicks diesel over the top, uh, as diesel was eliminating comma. And after the match, they tease that diesel is going to attack Shawn Michaels, but instead they do their high five routine, two and a half stars. Did you even discuss a, a different piece of creative here? Why not have diesel just blow up on Sean here? Sure. Discussed it. But I think that for that very reason, why, why not have him do it right there? Because that's what everybody's expecting. I think that that's what a lot of the audience was expecting and take them on a ride. Well, nope, not yet folks. Undertaker and Bret Hart are in the, uh, title match here. And before the match diesel, uh, who's leaving the rumble meets with undertaker in the aisle diesel shoves Paul bear, which causes the two of them to square off and officials pull them apart. Undertaker eventually makes a comeback in the match, hits the tombstone pile driver, and then Diesel's going to grab the ref, throw him out of the ring. And the ref calls for a DQ. The idea, it seems like it's set here. When do you know for sure? Or when do you remember you guys being set on? okay, the title match is going to be Brett and Sean, and we're going to put diesel with taker. Well, we, we knew at the rumble. I mean, we actually, we knew before the rumble. That's That's what I was asking. I mean, yeah, that's where we were going. The attraction was, was diesel and undertaker. Did you know that in November? Do you think, or did it just reveal itself? Well, I think we, we knew it. You know, upon making the, the the title change, and I think it was something you know going into it that probably in December, yes, because you're looking at opponents for everybody for WrestleMania, and Undertaker Diesel was a natural attraction. That was something that you didn't even really need a build for. I don't want to see those two big bastards go at it. Do you think that uh, you guys had maybe lost some? Uh trust you'd lost some confidence with the consumer based on the way the finishes had been lately. I mean, the undertaker and Bret Hart here in the main event is a DQ. And, uh, you know, we go back a couple of in your houses before, and we were sort of telling the same story and you admitted that you hated the finish. Do you think you were perhaps burning the audience a little bit with some, some shit finishes on top? I think that sometimes we would rely too much on, on not, But again, that's all kind of relative. And I think that that is all more along the lines of personal preference. Well, just at in your house three, we did the, the weird deal where we pinned Owen, but he wasn't in the match in your house four, it's a DQ on top Mm -hmm. with bulldog and diesel, uh, in your house five, we do get a pin with Brett and bulldog, but, uh, in your house six is sort of the same thing again. We're seeing this, this DQ situation. Um, let's talk about it. We're, we're there and it is quite the match. Oh, before we talk about that, I do want to mention that as soon as Sean wins the rumble, it feels like business starts to uptick besides the pay-per-view, uh, in Fresno or the, the live show in Fresno did a sellout 9,600 fans, $130,000 Stockton for raw is a small arena, but it's still sold out 2904. And we also sold out San Jose for superstars. White Plains did 3000 tickets in a 3,400 seater, uh, Baltimore did 5,900, which is like double for what they've been doing and Madison square garden. Again, remember the last time we were here, we did 7,400 tickets. Now we did 15,000. Is it that automatic just based on your top guy? Or is there more involved th- in that? I think some of it is more involved in that, but yes, when they're great stories that people are more interested in, it's a build to WrestleMania. You're on the way and there's a heavier interest in the product during those times is that's kind of what it has been programmed as in the last few years. 
So people are know that, okay, hey, man, trust me anytime. Go see what the hell they're going to do. And business was good. It, it's sometimes seasonal in some of those markets. So people were, were ready for it. Oh, hey, real quick. I want to remind everybody and listen up wrestling fans. It's time to win with Zen. Get to wrestlingprizes.com right now to register for your chance to win one of four once in a lifetime digital Q and a sessions with wrestling legends like the nature boy himself, Ric Flair, Eric Bischoff, the WWE hall of famer, maybe the voice of wrestling, Jim Ross, or what about the hardcore legend, Mick Foley winners will also get an autographed replica title belt and a prize pack from Zen. That's America's number one nicotine pouch register once per day. Now through July 15th at wrestlingprizes.com. Here's a disclaimer for you. There's no purchase necessary to enter or win. It's open to us residents, 21 and over void. where prohibited for official rules. Visit wrestlingprizes.com. warning. This product contains nicotine. Nicotine is an addictive chemical. I want to mention too, what a great line this is here. It's expected the March 17th show with uh, Sean and diesel versus Brett and undertaker may be the first non pay-per-view sellout at Madison square garden in so many years, nobody can even remember the last time. So it feels like there is light at the end of the tunnel. And a lot of that is because they made the switch from perhaps it being all about diesel to it's more about Brett and Sean. And, uh, we start to talk on February 12th or we see talk in the observer that diesel and razor Ramon may go to WCW after their contracts expire when you're, I don't know. So I'm asking, but when you're in these booking meetings at any point, do you guys back then, not now, but back then, did you like make a list of here's our baby faces, here's our heels and try to put everybody together. And when you're doing something like that, are you also considering, well, we don't have this guy resigned. This guy's only going to be here three more months. We don't know you know, what he's going to want contract wise. Does all that play into it even back then? The contracts were for whatever, $250 or whatever they were. There were no guaranteed contracts at this time. I didn't mean, I didn't mean dollar figures. I just mean dates. Like after the whole Lex Luger debacle, are we now more focused on, Hey, well, we don't know that we've got him past so-and-so. Well, I certainly would hope so because I wasn't involved in, in the contract dates at that time per se, and looking, having a whole sheet that laid out, Hey, this contract's coming up versus this one or anything else that that was somebody else in the office that was doing that. And, you know, you would hear about it when it got nut cutting time and nobody had signed. Yeah. But, uh, at, at that point, no, I, the next, the next week, Vince is complaining of contract tampering and he's bringing up specifically diesel, believe it or not, the bushwhackers and John Pierre Lafitte, who we know is yeah, real tied. Anyway, he claims diesel was offered a three-year deal by an intermediary. So not officially WCW, but certainly somebody's carrying their water for him. And McMahon tells others and diesel that, uh, he's been offered $750,000 per year. And it's written quote, most expect him to take it when his Titan contract expires in April at his age with a family. If that figure is accurate, he'd be a fool not to. It's also believed WCW made overtures about bringing in razor Ramon, who was originally a strong WWF team player in the locker room, but his mood changed with a shrinking paycheck during the fall along with being unhappy about certain aspects of how he's been used, including the feud with gold dust, not to mention the family issues, which are a prime issue since the WCW road schedule is so much easier. McMahon claimed with the money being offered as the word has gone through his dressing room, along with easier work schedule, it's hurt morale. Is that accurate? That somehow, some way dollar figures start being mentioned about contracts over in WCW and it trickles down and upsets the locker room here in the WWF. No, well, sure. Because that was what they wanted to do. That that's exactly what WCW wanted to do. Uh, better work conditions over here. Hey, come over here. We're just doing TV and we'll give you a guaranteed contract. You'll know exactly what you're going to make, but the work schedule, the, the dollar amount, the guaranteed dollar amount was something that they had never had before. And looking at, do I want to work live events here and potentially make a shitload more money? Or do I want to go there, work less dates, and I know exactly what I'm going to get paid? 
tell me how you find out that Nash has an offer from WCW. Does, does Kevin come into the office? Does he meet y'all at TV? Does he talk to Vince alone? Is it a phone call and Vince tells you, how did you know? I, I mean, actually the, I think, and this is my recollection. So again, this is how the order in which I found out. Uh, was Razor first? Right. Was that Razor had a deal and that um, Razor had been offered and not directly? I think they used at that time maybe DDP or somebody else. So it wasn't um, anyone specifically from WCW in the office going, "Hey, we're offering you a contract." So it would have been contract tampering. But I believe they used an intermediary. I believe it was DDP. It may have been someone else. It may have been other people that, Hey, if you came here, here's, here's a sample of what you might be able to make. And then when the window came time for them to be able to discuss and talk with other groups, they went in and they made their deal, but it was, um, letters of offer and things like that. Uh, not necessarily, you know, contract negotiations and shit like that, that was going on. But at first I heard it was, it was razor. And then there were the rumblings about Kevin Nash because, you know, both were asked, um, razor, (laughs) razor stepped up and said, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about making a move. Um, if you guys could give me a guarantee and I knew what I was making, then I would consider to, to stay. Uh, Kevin said he wasn't leaving. Kevin had given Vince his word. I'm not leaving. That turned out not to be the case. How pissed off was Vince about this, uh, quote unquote contract tampering. And is it, is it fair? I know that sounds silly, but a lot of people would say, oh, well, Vince did this in the eighties to every territory. What's the difference? What say you? No, he didn't guys didn't have contracts in the eighties with, with other promoters. Guys didn't have guaranteed contracts in, in the eight. Where, uh, name one, name one that had a contract that Vince tampered with. Well, but I mean, even, I mean, I don't know what we're even t- discussing contracts for really, because Vince McMahon, I mean, you yourself said the contracts were for $250 a show or $250 or whatever it is. So but they were contracts and they were contracts. They were contracts for an independent contractor, um, to work with them. But back in the day, those guys didn't have contracts at all. There were no contracts. It was like, Hey, if I'm a booker, Hey, uh, Conrad, uh, you want to come in and work my territory? Great. Come on in and work. Let me see if you get over. If you get over, you stay as long as you're making money. Uh, if you're not getting over, Hey man, here's your notice. Go find someplace else to work. Vince was looking at it differently. Vince wanted to go all over the country. He went across looking for top talent. Hey, would you like to come in and work with me? Yes, I would. Let's there talk no guaranteed contracts in that. He wasn't going, Oh, Hey, over here, you're going to make X amount of money. Didn't have that to offer. Didn't offer that. It was come on in here. This is what I'd like to do. Is this something you're interested in? And talent came in and did it. Let's talk about the next in your house. Diesel's back in the main event. Uh, Brett's going to beat diesel in a cage match here in 1913. Uh, Meltzer just continues to beat up diesel, even forgetting the confines of the match. Diesel looked slow and unimpressive and heart lacked fire. It picked up in the last few minutes and had a great finish as diesel was about to go out the door to win undertaker came from under the ring and grabbed his foot and dragged him under the ring and special effects of smoke under the ring went through the ring. Hart then escaped the cage to win, but came out of the show once again as a second tier star underneath Undertaker, Diesel, Michaels, and Vader. Diesel then climbed back from under the ring with his pants torn and climbed the cage, running away from the Undertaker to show that he was afraid of him. Ironically, after being largely cheered during the match, Diesel was almost 100% booed afterwards, star and a half. There's a lot of, uh, rumor and innuendo around this match, especially when putting the match together backstage. What do you remember about the, uh, the stunt of undertaker being under the, under the ring? And I think you've told that story before, but the legend of Brett not being happy with something they're trying to put together in the match and the undertaker sort of snapping. 
Yeah, and again, I wasn't there for that, but I, I think that overall, to me, I think that this was some of the best work of Devil of Devil of Diesel's career. Yeah. So I thought the match was good. It told a great story, and this was the Diesel that I wish we had had, you know, the year before. So as far as his work and as far as what he was doing at this time, I thought his work was tremendous. The stuff with Undertaker coming through the ring, love that. And that's the one where <laughs> Kevin even had the idea of going under the ring and spray painting his hair gray and coming out with his, you know, his head completely gray after being under the ring with the undertaker. What the hell did he see? Whatever he saw, it turned his hair gray and scared him to death. Um, uh, I love that idea. God damn too hokey. Um, oh, well, Chat me I up. thought it was good. I thought the, I thought the whole angle and everything about it was good. Meltzer would continue, um, that perhaps warriors coming in because diesel and Ramon and internally you guys may have feared other guys may be leaving. So if you're about to potentially lose some star power, you need to make some concessions and get some star power back. Did that play into Vince's rationale for being interested in talking to warrior again here in 96, the idea that he might be losing some guys. We were already negotiating with warrior long before we were new. We were losing guys. Let's talk about, uh, this WCW rumor. Uh, this is from the March 4th issue of the observer diesel. The other half of the two, some wildly rumored all week to be WCW bound also missed the weekend shows with a degree of controversy somewhat attached. Diesel suffered a combination separated and fractured shoulder, apparently early in the in your house cage match against Bret Hart. The injury may partially or totally explain the poor quality of that match compared with previous matches. The two have had. Diesel did swing an ax pretty good the next night in the angle where he destroyed undertaker's casket and also worked against Bob Holly, but didn't work the superstars taping the next night where they were scheduled to hold the first triple threat match involving himself, Brett and undertaker in Virginia. Diesel was said to have been unhappy with that headline program, even though it figured to be a big draw in that match. Diesel was pulled due to the injury and Hart wrestled undertaker for the title with diesel's interference leading to undertaker getting pinned. It was expected that similar endings were planned for the weekend with a series of shows at Continental Arena, uh, formerly the Meadowlands, the Pittsburgh Civic Center, and the Gund Arena in Cleveland. Diesel was expected to appear at those shows, uh, be announced as injured, and then get involved in the match, and one would assume in the finishes, allowing Brett to retain the title. However, Diesel refused to make the bookings, leading to Goldust getting involved in East Rutherford and Cleveland and Pittsburgh. So chat me up. Uh, it looks like the wheels are coming off the diesel express here. He's not happy and he's hurt. And this is a reason to not appear, but you've often said here on the show, if you're advertised, you make the show, even if it's just to go out and wave, right? Yeah, that's a good rule of thumb. I think that that's, you know, treating your audience with respect and doing what you need to do. And I think that Kevin just didn't, didn't want to do it. What, what do you remember about, um, and I know this seems silly for us to double down on, but I am curious, why do you think Kevin Nash wasn't interested in a triple threat concept? Why did he not, do you know, did you ever speak to him about that? Cause it is an early thing. No, I never time. spoke to him. It, it was said he was hurt. Didn't want to do it. Okay, great. Next. I, I if you know, you, you want to get into the head of of Kevin Nash, that's probably a pretty freaky place to be. But, uh, I think that at the end, if he, if he did indeed have a deal, then it's like, why am I going to hurt myself here and jeopardize what I'm going to do down there? I'm just saying, it feels like it's written that he didn't like the idea of a triple threat. Is that because the money would be cut three ways? I don't know. I just, I, I don't believe that. Um, okay. Maybe he did. I, again, I don't know. I never spoke to him about it. However, I would say that the mindset of him is like, why would I go in and get hurt? And if I am hurt, why would I take any risk and injure myself further? Um, Meltzer would continue later at press time. The future of diesel also 36 and the WWF is speculative. The dressing room gossip was leaning towards the idea that he was also WCW bound as he also has a family and the WCW combination of guaranteed long-term money and easier travel schedule is more family friendly. 
Rumors have been that they're offering, depending upon who you believe, anywhere from 450 to 750 per year for a three year guaranteed deal to make the jump and go in as a heel and work a program against Hogan, which naturally would be the top angle in the company. Unlike the Scott Hall deal, this isn't considered as virtual of a lock, and more simply that the odds are better than 50% he'll make the jump. He's also been unhappy about his role in the WBF since the decision was made to take the title from him last year. And as of right now, the expectations were that we didn't know if diesel would be back in time for MSG on March 17th, instead of just waiting to find out the WBF made the announcement at the East Rutherford show that the card was being changed to diesel and Sean against Brett and undertaker. Uh, and now it's going to be Brett versus Sean and Goldust versus the undertaker. So they're making the change. Even if he can appear at, at this point, had you sort of already understood that, Hey, he's playing it like he's not leaving, but he's leaving. I was, <laughs> you know, um, again, I just looked, you, you can read the tea leaves and read the writing on the wall. And I did not have the confidence that, uh, the diesel was even remotely thinking about staying. So to me, you know, next, I think that there was uh, some hope and probably a feeling on Vince's part that no, 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 he'll come around. Everything will be all right. Do you think, um, Kevin sort of slow rolled it? I mean, it's even written here that diesel's window to give notice on his contract automatically renewing for one year was to end at the end of this week. So it feels like he's holding out until the very last minute. Is that just because he dreads? disappointing Vince and telling him no, or do you think maybe he's hoping something will change and he'll be happier creatively, or maybe Vince will come make some concession. Why do you think he waited until the last possible minute? I think he didn't want to tell Vince. Yeah. That's, that's my thinking. I don't know. Well, it happens. Uh, Kevin Nash officially gave notice that he would be leaving the world wrestling federation to accept the offer from world championship wrestling in a phone call to Vince McMahon at 10 50 AM on March 5th. How fascinating is that when they pinpoint the time? I'm sure, I'm sure Dave was on the other line. I'm sure Dave was right there with the exact, you know, probably time stamped it. Cause he's, he's there in everything. He knows everything. He's all knowing. He's a genius. He fucking gets everything right. Have you, ever, have you ever done which which you know? Of course, I get sent to me all there. Have you ever done that deep dive? You know, like we do deep dives and a sort of thing. We we need to do. This is what we need to do. No. We need to do a deep dive on Dave Meltzer no, 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 and no, 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 no. and the percentage of times that no. he was actually correct versus the times where he made up everything and was completely fucking wrong. And you'll probably find out that he's wrong 98% of the time. I think you're 98% wrong in saying that. Scott Hall. No, I'm 100% correct in saying that because most of the shit he makes up or he guesses. How would you know? I do know. Because I do know when he, when he writes his little shit, you don't know you weren't there. 100% fucking wrong. When he talks about meetings that I'm in <laughs> and Dave's not there and there's only two other people in the room, they, there's no fucking way that he was there. And that what he says was discussed and or said is not even remotely close to factual. I wasn't even there. And that, that motherfucker's never stepped foot inside of a meeting with Vince McMahon when we were discussing any of this shit. Has never been in a creative meeting on this side of the table. He's never been in business. Think about this. He's never been in the business. He's never had any other business other than write gossip and make shit up. And since he was the only guy doing it, came across and became the wrestling journalist and the expert of shit that nobody else could ever fucking verify and or deny. That's who he is. As a reminder, Scott Hall gave notice on February 20th. What time did he give the notice? <sighs> Was it telephone, telegraph or tell wrestler? Nash, Nash is scheduled to start back with the WBF on March 15th. After missing a few weeks with a separated and fractured shoulder, 
An inner office memo sent in the WWF by Linda McMahon stated that there would be no change in previously scheduled bookings involving Nash, who would continue to work for the company through June 6, 1996. Do you remember Vince making an attempt to change his mind? I I would definitely bet that he did. I wasn't involved in any of those. So unlike Dave Meltzer, I'm not going to say that that definitely happened because I wasn't involved in any of them, but I'm sure he did. I, I would not be surprised if he did. Hypothetically, what do you think that context of that conversation would look like? Is it about, you know, we're going to, we're going to get back around creatively or, you know, we'll see if we can, you know, create some new revenue opportunities or you don't want to leave here. They don't know what to do with a guy like Kevin Nash. Do you have any idea what that pitch sounds like? No, I don't. I think that more than anything, it would be an attempt to find out, you know, what's more attractive on the other side that you don't have here. And is there a way that we could correct that? Is there a way that we could create what it is that you're looking for here? I mean, that's, that's how I would approach it based on, you know, and that's how I think Vince would approach it based on how he's approached other similar situations. So it's not all bad news here, by the way, Brett and undertaker team up to take on Sean and diesel at that March 17th, Madison square garden show. And it's the first sellout for a non-pay-per-view event. Again, it's described as in so many years, nobody can remember the last one. It also set an all time gate record for a house show. So on diesel's way out, it feels like things are starting to heat up. It's interesting how sometimes, cause really there's no new signings, right? We just reshuffled the deck and fans are all over it. Yeah. And, you know, you kind of shored up the creative and did some different things. And, you know, it's, it's funny the, the comment about, you know, the last time it sold out that no one can even remember because, you know, again, from his proficient business experience that he doesn't realize that within our books, we have all the dates and all of the houses for like the last couple of years in our books, literally. So we know what the trends are in each and every market. So, yeah, of course he's factual here because he couldn't remember. He's trying to put it over, but okay. Uh, WrestleMania well, but by saying, you know, some of yours, no, no one can remember. We certainly could remember those of us actually in the business doing the business. He couldn't remember because he makes so much shit up. He can't remember his lies. WrestleMania 12 undertaker pin diesel in 1646 with a tombstone. We just recently talked about this match in the WrestleMania 12 episode. So I don't know that there's much more to talk about, but if you want to know more about that match, please go check out WrestleMania 12 in the archives. It's something to wrestle.com. Uh, Meltzer would say the WWF took excellent advantage of its largest raw audience ever with one of its best shows ever. The company shot angles to heat up the upcoming Shawn Michaels versus diesel and warrior versus Goldust matches on pay-per-view on April 28th. They also built further into the future for an eventual pay-per-view with Vader versus Yoko that'll likely take place in May or June and Ahmed versus Davey, which should be a house show program. So it's interesting that diesel and razor are leaving. Things are getting hot. Was there a thought to try and keep the band together at this point on TV and just make the most out of the ratings or these days, would you just probably ease them off TV? You know, I think the the idea was to ease them off TV and move on more than anything else. Um, they're both going to finish up Meltzer believes on May 19th. I believe that after the pay-per-view and TV tapings, they're both going to work Baltimore, Philly, and the Madison square garden house show run from the 17th to the 19th. And that's it. Um, and he also says there's no truth to any rumors that Ramon wanted to stay and was turned down. That's probably the well, whole, uh, he's well, just hang on here again, rumors and him being wrong. Um, I think Scott didn't want to leave. Yeah. Scott definitely didn't want to leave. And up until the last minute, you know, Scott did come back with, well, if you did this, you would, you know, if you could guarantee me money and you could do this and you, so Scott was pitching up until he left. I don't think Kevin was, I I don't recall Kevin doing that, but, but Scott did because Scott actually pitched me and any pitch events, um, and we couldn't, you know, just couldn't do that just for them. 
at that time. We just talked about Shauna Diesel putting on an incredible performance at In Your House in Omaha. Check that out in the archives from uh, last month or earlier this month. But here's where we're starting to get to the nitty gritty. The final appearances of Diesel and Razor in the WWF came in a strange curtain call finale of the Click before the first indoor non pay per view house. Uh, in WWF history to top $300,000 on May 19th, the garden second straight sellout. The first time it's happened in 11 years of 18,800 fans paying $319,411. Let me back up before you can go into this. Okay. Okay. That weekend, the, the last dates that they were, that they were with us. And I believe we were in Philadelphia and maybe Baltimore, Philadelphia. I, I don't recall. I'm pretty damn sure that one of them was Philadelphia and the garden being the last one. Uh, we were on that tour. Uh, Pat and I were going on it anyway, and Vince ended up, you know, riding with us and we went and, and made all of those live events. And I would have to say that those last three events where Kevin and Scott were, was probably the the most fun I ever had with those two guys where they were in absolute great spirits. They were easy to get along with, easy to do business with, um, and fun. So it, 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 in up in, up until what you're going to discuss here in a minute, uh, th- there was even a part of me going, you know what, man? I'm almost a little sad they're leaving if we could have these guys <laughs> all the time. You right. know what I mean? Right. Well, let's talk about it. Uh the, the Garden's second straight sellout here, three hundred and nineteen grand. Uh many were saying it's the best MSG show since WrestleMania ten. Uh and here's the write up. Both Diesel and Ramon in their final appearances before starting with WCW in mid June were the recipient of You Sold Out and Please Don't Go Chance by a decent percentage of the crowd that seemed to know it was their final show. Ramon was booed in his match with Hunter and heavily booed with a loud, you sold out chant after he did the job. After the match, he grabbed the house mic and before he could get more than a few words out, panicked WWF officials, since this wasn't part of the show, cut the power as it was all Ramon ended up saying was something to the effect of say goodbye to the bad guy. However, it wasn't over for the bad guy just yet. After a very strong main event cage match where Shawn Michaels beat diesel to keep the title, it was time for the curtain call. Michaels had won the match by walking out of the cage after laying diesel out with a super kick. And after the match, Michaels kissed diesel who revived like a frog kissed by the princess and the two hugged in the ring. Diesel got a lot more cheers during the match than most would have figured. Although Michaels was still the most popular wrestler on the show. Ramon and fellow click member Helmsley then came to the ring and the four got on all four posts and gave the click signals to the fan fans. Some of whom were teary eyed saying it's one of the best moments of wrestling in Madison square garden in years. Supposedly the final display wasn't approved by WWF officials, but it got over great with the audience. So little will probably result from it. However, there were other wrestlers who were very unhappy at what they considered a kayfabe violation particularly since Helmsley was in the ring, hugging, hugging Ramon and diesel had just finished a match with Michaels and magically arose from a finishing move by being kissed. The other click member, one, two, three kid wasn't at this show as his future with the company is somewhat in question after he showed up at the superstars taping in no condition to perform and won't be back until June at the earliest. So a lot to unpack here. It is interesting quote. So little will probably result from it. And depending on who you believe, that's not the case. Take us back to this oh so talked about moment. I hated it. Uh, I absolutely hated it. Um, you know, I didn't know anything about it until it actually happened when the guys went out. I'm kind of like, what the fuck? And uh, we, you know, Sean went down and did the kiss, and Diesel popped up, and they all hugged, and they started going around the ring, and uh, we left. So I, that's all I saw. Did you guys go to, uh, one of those steakhouse dinners that were famous after MSG? And if so, what was the tone and tenor of that? I don't know. I, I think we went out and ate afterwards, but, uh, I know Jim Cornette was with us and he was not happy. I wasn't happy. Vince wasn't happy. And, 
but it, it's you can bitch about it and bitch about it all you want. It was done. At that point, what are you going to do? Fire him? I want to mention too the this last tour of duty here, this last string of house ma- house show matches. Uh, it's headlined by Sean versus Diesel, and usually it's with the British Bulldog interfering. But there was a Hershey show, and he he's Kevin Nash is refusing, saying I'm not going to do a double shot. So on that show, Davy boy worked against Sean, you know, you said going into the weekend, you wish, oh, we could have these guys hang out more often was part of you got, or what was part of the crew behind the scenes, just sort of exhausted with all this, like just fucking go already. Yes, I think so. Okay. Uh, well, listen, we know what's going to happen. They're going to go, uh, down South, set the NWO on fire and, uh, really supercharge the business for a few years. But there's always a whisper and a rumor that, Hey, Kevin Nash might be coming back to the WWF. Do you remember there ever being serious conversations when he was with WCW that, Hey, we might be getting Kev back. Not to my knowledge at all. That doesn't mean there weren't, but I never, to my knowledge, I never heard that. Uh, Kevin Nash in the, uh, WWE, uh, when we're going to see him back, we did a whole NWO in the WWE episode in the archives. Uh, So if you want to hear more about his NWO and the WWE run, go check that one out. But I do want to talk about, uh, Nash after the NWO and tearing his quad because it is a shame to see, um, April 21st, 2003, uh, it's in the observer that we've got a a spot here to chat me up about the injury, what the plans were. It felt like the whole thing at this point, the NWO and the WWE was just snake bit. Did it not? Yeah, boy, it did. Um, it wasn't a couple of things. I, I, I think that with the whole NWO angle in WWE, I think it would have been better had Bischoff been involved in it and Bischoff be the one to bring them in, uh, in a little bit different way. Um, you know, I mean, since Jr. signed everybody from Jack Briscoe to Harley Race, Dusty Rhodes, and Carl Gotch, um, that uh, maybe I, I, I don't even know what I'm trying to say here. I, I, I it was it was snake bit is probably the best way to put it. But yeah, I couldn't get couldn't get Eric in at that time and Eric wasn't interested in, in doing it. And I think that would have helped it. Maybe that's a reason it could be that all night gas station that opened up and, and was selling bad slurpees, uh, and just fucked to people's mind that they didn't like it. It just, it, 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 it was off about three steps, not even just a half a step. It was off about three steps and felt weird. It felt forced. Let's talk about Kevin Nash in this era backstage. It's been reported that that whole Goldberg Jericho dust up all stemmed from Kevin Nash, supposedly stirring the shit. Here's the report. Get out. Goldberg was talking to Nash earlier in the night about his angle where Nash was going to power bomb Jericho and Goldberg made a comment about Jericho selling, which naturally got back to Jericho. It's believed that either Nash told Jericho or more likely that Shane Helms overheard the conversation and went to Jericho. Jericho then confronts Goldberg. Hey, we're no longer in WCW and they have their altercation. So Meltzer himself can't confirm that it's Nash, but right or wrong, Kevin Nash did earn. And and he even brags about the fact that he had a reputation for stirring shit up. It was entertaining for him. How big of a pain in the ass was this when he's back with the company here? Oh, I think, I mean, that's Kevin's nature. That's what Kevin does. Kevin likes to have fun. And Hey, did you hear, Um, you know, true or not? I don't know if this was Kevin that did this. Um, but you know, whatever it got around pretty quick and got back to Jericho pretty quick that, you know, you got something to say, say it to my face and the rest, as they say, is history. There was talks in the, uh, online in this era that Kevin Nash was going to become diesel. He's going to assume the diesel character again. And Kevin Nash claimed in a WWE.com interview that the plans for him to come back with the diesel name were changed because even a week after dying his hair, 
it was coming back gray and he didn't think diesel should have gray hair. Uh, quote, sounds like a silly reason as any, he still debuted with his diesel fist mannerism that he has, he was banned from doing in WCW and the old diesel music. WWE had sent out advertising the different arenas for upcoming appearances of Nash, calling him diesel and not Nash, even as late as the weekend who loved the idea of diesel and why ultimately were you guys non-committal and, and didn't really pull the trigger on it. I don't remember during this time frame of, of wanting to bring him back as diesel. There was talk about, um, who's more over Kevin Nash or diesel on their own. And the feeling was to this audience, it would be diesel. Um, then the whole NWO thing came up and it was NWO and in the NWO, he was Kevin Nash. Did you have a preference that you thought would have worked better here? Um, I agree with that. If it was in the NWO, it would be Nash. I'm just saying now that the NWO thing is, is done and it's dying a death, <laughs> you- but he can't, but again, this for the same reason, I didn't like referring to diesel as Kevin Nash when he, you know, from Tennessee and got a damn basketball player, uh, that, Wait, I get what you're saying. You're saying I didn't want to go back and forth there here. Kevin Nash. Now he's back to diesel because that's, but in your opinion, Kevin Nash was more successful than diesel. So why would you go back and talk about something that wasn't as successful? No, no. Because in the end, diesel, I think was extremely successful in WWE. I'm just saying that when you bring someone back as Kevin Nash, and then you're going to reinvent them back to diesel, (sighs) Uh, the blooms off that rose. Kevin Nash returns to the ring on April 12th, 2003, teaming with Shawn Michaels and Booker T to take on triple a trick flair and Chris Jericho at a house show. It's Michael's first house show in five years. Uh, this is kind of a cool deal, right? You're getting the whole band back together. Kevin Nash, Shawn, triple H all in the same ring. And of course they're tight with Booker T from WCW and Jericho sort of the same thing. And of course we know Sean and triple H really look up to Ric Flair. It seems like we're at least trying to have fun with some of this booking. Absolutely. And you, you got your biggest stars in one match. So yeah, it's, it's definitely a lot of fun. Are you feeling like given how things have been snake bit with the NWO and now Kevin's been hurt, uh, now that he's finally back, it's like, it feels like you might be sort of like a GM with that first round draft pick quarterback. You're like, well, we're paying him all this money. We got to get something out of him. Did you feel like, man, we haven't gotten our return on investment. We need to figure something out quickly. I'm not sure that we ever got the return on that investment. When did you start to realize maybe it's time to throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak? I, I think that, you know, when the injuries started coming up again, I see. Well, let's talk about backlash. Oh, three it's Flair, triple H and Jericho on one side, Booker T Kevin Nash and Sean on the other Meltzer would say the match was supposed to focus on Nash versus triple H to build them up. And everyone else's role was supposed to be secondary. Everyone sold big for Nash who at least wasn't exposed or turned on Flair had Michaels in the figure four while Jericho used a lion salt on him. Jericho got the walls up or got the walls on, but Nash saved Michaels. Uh, Nash gave Jericho the snake eyes, ref bump, Nash power bombs, Jericho and triple H hits Nash with a sledgehammer for the pin. So triple H is pinning him in uh, a few minutes here, 17 minutes and 51 seconds, two and a half stars. You know, it's been written Lord. There's been tons of speculation. Kevin Nash didn't like to lose. Did he have a problem losing to Hunter? Not to my knowledge. Never said anything to me at all. So now we're going to try Kevin Nash in that singles position for the world title at judgment day. Oh, three against triple H it goes to a DQ when uh, Hunter hits the referee Earl Hebner with a sledgehammer. They only go seven minutes and 49 seconds. Sean and Ric Flair were scheduled to be in the participants corners, but they're ejected for brawling before the opening bell. And after the bout Nash drops triple H with the snake eyes on the exposed turnbuckle and then hits the power bomb. But then everybody comes out. Sergeant Slaughter, Terry Taylor, Tony Gurria, the referees, and they're all holding, uh, trying to help the champion backstage, but Nash is going to jump him, fight off flair, shove Michaels away and hit the power bomb on triple H through the raw announce table near the entrance way. Meltzer gave all of this a dud, 
but you know, it was big on story and it had some, some, some high spots. What'd you think of this? Did you, were you happy with it? Did it earn the dud rating? No, I, I think what the, the dud rating is just Dave looking in the mirror, maybe at all of his wrestling escapades, you know, back when he was on top, where was that? Did you like triple H? And, where was uh, Dave ever on top working to critique people? And anyway, uh, no, I thought, it, I thought it was okay. It wasn't great. One great by any stretch of the imagination. What are you looking for? You know, I know that seems silly, but sometimes you have different people in different spots for different reasons. Let me explain when the ultimate warrior and Hulk Hogan were on top, we're not exactly expecting them to put on the same type of performance that we would an Eddie Guerrero or a Chris Benoit or Kurt angle. But this feels like, you know, triple H is trying to go out there and have the big time WWF main event. Kevin Nash may have been more of a presence in a promo. Uh, when did you identify or how or were you having trouble identifying what's the best, I guess, using appraisal term, what's the highest and best use of Kevin Nash for us at this point is an attraction. Yeah. Uh, simply is an attraction. I don't, I, from day one, you're never looking for a 42 star in the Tokyo dome match out of Kevin Nash, right? You're looking for Kevin to be that big fucking attraction. And I think Kevin is capable of doing that. He was in, and uh, always was. Bad blood. We're back, but this time we, uh, we're doing a hell in a cell and, uh, Mick Foley gets a bigger pop than either guy coming out according to Meltzer. Uh, but they pull out all the stops, including a toolbox, a hammer, a hammer to the head. Uh, people are bleeding. Uh, it's a spectacle three and a half or sorry, three and a quarter stars. But in the end, triple H pins, Kevin Nash again. Um, what do you think? Hell in a cell. It feels like at this point. We're trying to force this into being a successful feud. And I'm not sure that fans are all the way with it. Let's say you, I think they were. And I think that, you know, again, for what it was, you, you're looking at an attraction and you're looking at, okay, what's this going to look like and put a couple guys out there and the payoff to this, I thought, I thought it was good. Um, Okay. Let's, let's, let's move on. But before we do, I, I want to ask about Kevin Nash and his, uh, physical situation. If we think there's a concern with his injuries and whatnot, do we want him to be power bombing people off of ramps and working in hell in a cell matches? Does any of that come into play or is it just a matter of, Hey, either he can do it or he can't. We're going to find out. You, you have to take people at their word. And if someone tells you that, you know, they're feeling good and there aren't any problems, any, you know, obvious problems under examination, then you've got to take people for the word. Yeah, I can do it. And they show they can do it. So there's, you can have a feeling all day long, but you have to, you know, get to the point of, is there anything physically wrong with them? No, there's not. Is there anything that would prevent them from doing this? No, there's not. Then you go to them. Are you comfortable doing this? And and if everyone is comfortable doing it and everyone is confident, then you, you have to go with that. I want to remind everybody that, uh, this bad blood show here, <laughs> it's, uh, it's right before test wrestles, Kevin Nash. That's on uh, July 7th. So test beats Kevin Nash with a boot to the face in a minute and 47 seconds. After pushing and interfering Trish Stratus into Nash. And of course, after the bout test pushed Trish into the ringside barrier, but still test over Nash in under two minutes. I don't know that I would have ever called that. Well, again, you look at, you know, the future and test was someone that had youth and looking at possibly doing something with him. The, uh, July 28th, 2003 raw, we would see Kevin Nash defeat Chris Jericho by disqualification after an impromptu match following a low blow. And then after the match, Nash is going to bloody and brutalize Jericho inside the ring and around the ringside area. Eventually Jericho escapes through the crowd. How was their relationship at this point? It feels like once upon a time, Nash probably wasn't well thought of by Chris Jericho, the whole vanilla midgets thing, but it feels like. Once they're here in the company, and especially these days, they're on a whole new wavelength. 
Again, man, I, I look. Holding grudges and shit like that. Business is business. And to my knowledge, there was no bad blood at all there. It was business. April, April 4th, 2003, Goldberg defeats Ric Flair by DQ when Randy Orton interferes. And after the match, a brawl ensues, including evolution, Shawn Michaels, Kevin Nash, Goldberg, and Chris Jericho. And then Steve Austin comes out to announce the new main event for SummerSlam is all men, all six men in an elimination chamber match. So again, even though Tess just beat him on TV, he's back in the main event. It's good for him. Uh, Rob Van Dam is going to pin Chris Jericho with a split legged moonsault. And after the bout, Jericho is going to blame the earlier brawl with Kevin Nash on his loss. And, uh, he's going to challenge Nash to a hair versus hair match. Boy, this is, uh, some old school booking. What do you remember about that? I remember that Nash needed a haircut for the movie that he was doing. So let's make something out of it. Yeah, but I'll tell you how I personally felt about it. Same way that I felt that, uh, the, uh, Jeff Jarrett and one, two, three kid, uh, hair match was a complete, complete piece of shit. Madison square guard many years before that, you know, you, you cut Jeff's hair and gave him a better looking haircut than the haircut he had before. Same thing with Kevin. You cut his hair, he looks better than he did with all the fucking long hair. It's supposed to embarrass um, him, not, not improve him. To yeah. be a hair match is you shave people bald. Right. Not just give them a better haircut. Can we get so, you to, to do a hair match one day, me and you? What's that? Can me and you do a hair match one day? Sure. I mean, I ain't doing no job. <laughs> what if I got Dr. Tom to hold you down and get revenge? I wouldn't have a choice, really. <laughs> Wait a minute now. Didn't I mean, you, I'll do it for the payday. Didn't you, you know, start this show? No say, mistake about it whatsoever. But you're a four time karate black belt hall of famer. What can Dr. Tom has he five time? Why are you scared of him? Cause he's scary. So Jericho wins the hair versus hair match. Uh, there's some brass knuckles involved and, uh, yeah. So there you go. Uh, SummerSlam 03. It's Triple H, Shawn Michaels, Bill Goldberg, Kevin Nash, Randy Orton, and Chris Jericho in an elimination chamber match. What a star studded affair that is. They go 19 minutes and 15 seconds. And uh, ultimately, you know what's coming. Triple H pins Goldberg after avoiding the spear, hits him in the face with a sledgehammer that was thrown in the ring. And then after the bout, Flair, Orton, and Triple H bloody Goldberg, handcuffing him to the cage so Triple H could once again hit him in the head with a sledgehammer. So Triple H is victorious. Uh, Meltzer would call this a burial of Kevin Nash on his way out. And this is the last pay-per-view main event of Kevin Nash's career. Did you know what was going on with Kevin at this point that, Hey, he's leaving to make this movie and this is probably it. No, it wasn't. I mean, from our vantage point, it wasn't probably going to be it. We knew he was going away to make the movie. That's why we cut his hair. Well, he disappears, uh, from the WWE, at least for now, he films the Punisher. He films the longest yard and, uh, he returns at the Royal rumble in 2011. So like eight years later, what the? uh, and TNA had been pushing he him Returned his diesel. Didn't he? Yes. And then yes. you got to work with him, uh, as Kevin Nash down in TNA, but for like two shows, maybe his WWE run here though, sort of the second act. When he comes back as Kevin Nash, we've, we've detailed the whole NWO run, but when we try him as singles, it just doesn't really pick up any momentum. Had the business changed? Had the company changed? Had he not changed? What was different about Kevin Nash's second act with the company? I think the audience changed and there wasn't as much bleed over from the old WCW that was into the outsiders and the NWO. There wasn't as much uh, bleed over. They were vocal kind of like the ECW crowd, but there just weren't as many of them that really came over to support that. And, you know, times change, people change, their tastes change. Um, you know, you go back, you go back to the, to the heyday of, of the click. And, um, those guys weren't the most fun to work with. Uh, however, you know, you get Kevin Nash, you sit there with a bottle of wine and Kevin Nash and have a few drinks at the bar, or you get Kevin just sitting back watching the monitor TV hard, not to like that guy. 
I mean, he's really a fucking he's he's a funny, charming son of a bitch. I like Kevin Nash. Well, we hope that you like Ahmed Johnson because he's going to be our topic next week right here on something to wrestle. But before we get out of here, we've got a bunch of questions. There's no way we'll get to all of them. Let's do some rapid fire here. Bruce, are you ready? Okay. Rinks up. Mm, okay. That's a, that's an inside joke to one of my listeners. Ringside rent Jones says, what reason did Vince have for not giving diesel the money he wanted before leaving for WCW? It wasn't warranted. Brandon wants to know what is Bruce's take on Kevin Nash saying that his edgy character towards the end of his WWF run was the precursor to the stone cold character. I think that, you know, in a lot of ways, the attitude was, uh, Mr. Spanks wants to know, was Sean feeling any type of resentment of Nash getting the title after all Sean had been there for years and never gotten the big belt. I don't think so. Uh, Joey wants to know why didn't diesel ever get a marquee victory as champion. Sean was his biggest victory, but no one bought that it was Sean's time yet. He never beat Brett, Taker, or Lex on top. He beat Mabel. Uh, how much bigger do you want to get? In fairness, Mabel's though, bigger than all the motherfuckers probably put together. I know we make fun of you know, well, oh, wins and losses don't matter, blah blah blah. I get that, but I do think it's interesting that. You sometimes have said when you're talking about pushing Bret Hart, what would we do if it was Sean? Well, I mean, for Hulk, what would we do for Hulk? But yeah, Hulk beat everybody, but Nash didn't get to beat Bret, Taker, or Lex. Interesting. He beat Bret. When did he beat Bret? I don't know. He beat Bret, though. I think he's talking about as a, a you know, SummerSlam, WrestleMania type event. Anyway, Mike, well, there's says, only so many summer slams in WrestleMania per year. I love, why didn't you put this guy over? You put that guy over. Why, why didn't you put the other guy over? Fucking is subjective. What would you rather us talk about on these shows? Cause you're irritated with everything today. I, I am irritated with everything today. Well, I mean, what, what should I, we have talked? Did I not warn you? Yes. I sent you a fucking warning. Did I not? You did, but then you started off in a good mood and it quickly went did downhill. I- did, did I, it was like, I, I mentioned Meltzer and it just changed your whole mood. Why are you so gotten to changes my mood? Because he's a liar. He makes shit up and he's, he's regarded as the end all be all. When, if you dig down deep and really, we need to do that. No. I'll do I tell you, what, I'll do the research on it and I'll fucking turn the tables on you. Hey, Conrad, isn't this what Meltzer said, but isn't this what actually happened? I want to do that show. Why wow, though? But nobody cares. Oh, well, apparently they do since he's our goddamn expert. All right. Well, let me ask you then, Bruce, since you're taking an issue with the idea that I use Meltzer for our research, who no, should I use? Because I like, no, it's good because then I can get the real story out there. That's what I'm trying to do, but you're mad about it. No, I'm not mad about it. I just don't care for him. I don't care for his, I don't care for his, his lack of intelligent reporting and the way that he frames things. All right. Here's another one from Mike. Was it more challenging for you to have to deal with this collection of talent all seemingly together to dictate their direction? Or was it welcome in the sense that you had more ambitious talent willing to aggressively offer ideas? Of course, Mike is referring to the click there. Um, I always love talent to have aggressive ideas and offer ideas. It's the talent to sit back and say, what have you got for me? Or I don't like that. Okay. Well, what would you suggest? And they have nothing. I'd rather have guys bringing shit to us than not bringing shit to us every I, day of the week. Michael says, had diesel been brought in a few years earlier, do you believe he would have made a good heel to be in a program with Hulk Hogan? Uh, if he'd been brought in during the Hogan Ho- hey days, absolutely. He would have been a great heel. Can you and imagine, probably would have been a great baby face in that time too. It would have been tremendous to think of like diesel there in 91, 92. That could have been cool. Uh, James wants yeah. to know what's the best road story that Bruce has heard about diesel and the click. Hmm. I can't tell that. I can't tell the true best one. Um, why not? Oh, no, it, no, it's inappropriate. Okay. Um, I God, you know, you ask those kind of ones, like, Hey, what's the best ribs <laughs> and you can't think of any. And then 20 minutes later, I'll think of, Oh shit. I should have said that. So I, I don't really have one. All right, let's wrap this one up. we got one last question, and this is going to be one you got to think about before you immediately answer. 
Mr. Pritchard, you once said that the fans were behind diesel until quote unquote, they changed him in your professional opinion. Does that same logic apply to John Cena and Roman reigns? No, because it's, it's apples and pomegranates. What I mean by fans behind diesel is the character is a heel. They changed him. They is me. They is the creative. Uh, we changed him to a different role, changed his opponents, but then we changed the diesel character. And in one sitting, he went from being diesel to Kevin Nash playing the role of diesel. Cena and Roman are just Cena and Roman. John Cena is John Cena. John Cena is not playing a character. He is a character. Roman's Roman. Next week, we're going to be talking about Ahmed Johnson. Well, believe it or not, he's been one of our more requested topics. Are you looking forward to talking about Ahmed next week? Well, it'll be a short one. Why is that? Not a lot to talk about. I mean... We got 95, 96, and 97, right? Maybe a little 98. Well, it'll be interesting. I'll tell you that right now. Well, I'm looking forward to it. I think he's... I'm uh, looking forward to it too, Conrad. So do you want to freestyle a guess as to when you think we might be able to get everybody together and click record? Uh, What time is it? Uh, I don't know. Maybe later on today. How about that? Ladies and gentlemen, stay tuned. So for later an- on today or Tuesday, one of the two. What do you think about that, big boy? I'm I'm shocked, happy, excited, ready. Pretty happily shocked. I'm happy. Your little cheek, dude. Your little left cheek just got red on that. That's cute. Because I can't believe I get to talk to you again, and you you fuss at me about Dave Meltzer a little longer. It's fun. Well, that's what we do. It is what we do. We'll see you next week, right here on Something to Wrestle with Bruce Pritchard. Rock on. You weren't sure what to say there, were you? I got confused. Uh, We've been out of the habit lately, but it was nice catching up with you, buddy. It happens. Same thing. Go enjoy some alcohol and the rest of your Memorial day weekend. I got to eat. Are you feeling stuck making minimum payments on your credit card debt? Save with Conrad.com can help, and you don't need perfect credit or money out of your pocket to do this. NMLS number 65084, equal housing lender. Oh, and did I mention no house payments for two months? Get rid of your credit card debt and lower your monthly payments right now at SaveWithConrad.com. And with that, we knew what would happen. We'd see the debut of The Outsiders, the formation of the NWO and WCW, and a Hall of Fame career would have his path paved from that point going forward. It was a lot of fun listening to Bruce and Conrad talk about Kevin Nash's run in the World Wrestling Federation. We hope you enjoyed this special Megasode edition of Something to Wrestle with Bruce Pritchard. Again, make sure you're going out there and you are supporting Click This with Kevin Nash and Sean Oliver dropping July 11th at 6 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And if you haven't picked up your tickets yet for StarCast, make sure you're doing that as well. Kevin Nash is going to be there. I'm going to be there. Conrad's going to be there. And of course, Ric Flair's going to be there with his last match. It will be a weekend that we will not soon forget, July 29th through July 31st. With that, we'll see you next week here on Something to Wrestle with Bruce Pritchard.